Breaking news, rock stars. Isotope and Native Instruments have just released Music Production Suite 6, which includes an impressive collection of their best plugins and modules for production, mixing, and mastering. Ozone 11 Advanced helps you create professional quality masters from your mixes. I use Ozone all the time for mastering, and it's so easy to make my mixes sound like a finished record. Nectar 4 Advanced will help you get an instant vocal vocal sound for music, dialogue, or rap vocals, with everything you need from auto level and tuning to EQ, compression, de-essing, effects, and harmony all in one easy plugin. I'm using Nectar right now to mix this vocal. And Guitar Rig 7 Pro brings you a massive collection of classic sounding guitar pedals, amps, and cabinets for instant amazing guitar tones. Plus, there are many more great plugins included like RX and Neutron, and they all have the Smart Assistant built into it, so you can quickly get a great sound and then adjust it to your taste. Just go to isotope.com and remember to use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off. This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Isotope, Adam Audio, Lewitt, and Spectra 1964. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Lewitt Pure Tube microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX110D mic pre and C610 complimeter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes below. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. I've just been so lucky to work with really great artistry over my career, you know, and then, then, then there was the ones that weren't so great and Nafa would go, how, how can you do those records? And I, I go, well, Mark, it's like I try and give my all to every record that I do, no matter what, because that artist may only get one or two shots at making a record. I'm going to make another 30, 40, 50 more. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. My studio is proudly powered by OWC, and I love how it's improved my workflow. OWC can connect all your audio work drives, trackballs, mix controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, displays, or cameras so that you can work fast and focus on making your best record ever. Go look at the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, or Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars to find the perfect solution for your studio from OWC. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding much closer to professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools, and the best part is that these mixing techniques work for you in any DAW, whether you're on Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Reaper, anything you can think of. If you're ready now to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Chuck Ainley, a four-time Grammy winner with 10 ACM, two CMA awards, and two tech awards. Chuck has over 3,500 credits to his name, which, by the way, makes it quite a challenge to create a playlist of, of uh, past <laughs> records, including work with legendary and defining country music artists such as George Strait, Miranda Lambert, Steve Earle, Leanne Womack, Lyle Lovett, Emmylou Harris, and The Chicks. 
Chuck has placed his distinctive production and engineering stamp on projects with more mainstream artists such as Dire Straits and nearly the entire solo career of Mark Knopfler, as well as Peter Frampton, Taylor Swift, Lionel Richie, Ann Wilson, James Taylor, Jewel, Bob Seger, Pentatonix, and Cheryl Crow, just to name a few. His work in immersive mixing has resulted in groundbreaking projects such as the 25th and 35th anniversary remix of Peter Frampton's Frampton Comes Alive and the Grammy Award-winning 20th anniversary remix of the Dire Straits album Brothers in Arms. He is currently serving as trustee for the Nashville chapter of the Recording Academy and numerous terms as a governor. He has chaired the Nashville P&E Wing and is the current co-chair of the Recording Academy P&E Wing National Steering Committee. Chuck has been a co-author of the majority of the P&E Wing guidelines and recommendations. Chuck is also currently on the board of directors for the Country Music Association, and Belmont University has awarded him with the Robert E. Molloy Award of Excellence. That's awesome. Chuck is also a founding member of the Meta Alliance, um, although I guess it's pronounced Meta-Alliance, right? Yeah, we're trying to make the distinction because right, cool. we don't want to be Facebook, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Committed to promoting standards of quality in the arts and science of recorded music through education and product certification. A big shout out also and a thank you to Phil Wagner at SSL for making our introduction and reconnecting us. Although, Chuck, we've run into each other many times yeah. and just, uh, you know, finally had the opportunity to be here on the podcast. So please welcome... Chuck Ainlay to recording studio rock stars. Chuck, are you ready to rock? Dude? I'll try. <laughs> dude, so so um, it's funny because I, I like to say this. When I do an in-person in- interview in particular, um, there's a tendency for us to want to chat about stuff and talk about things beforehand. And I'm always like, um, you know, I, I say, like doing a band in the studio, you better be rolling for that first take. So I think I come off as as less welcoming because I don't want to start the conversation. So now I get to start the conversation. So welcome, man. It's a real honor to have you here in the studio. Oh, man, it's great to be here, for sure. Um, so, you know, you've come over. It's a beautiful day here, uh, rock stars. It's sort of, a, you know, this will date the, the episode a little bit, but it's warm weather. And um, Chuck drove over to my studio at the Toy Box where is you where where are you usually in Nashville and and where is your studio these days? Well, I had a the backstage room at Soundstage for like fifteen years, um, and it was bought by uh, Black River Records and publishing and all. Um, and they, you know, they asked me to stay around. I got to redesign my room, actually tear it completely to the ground, and build it brand new. Um, and it got so popular, I could never get in my studio. So I basically pulled all my gear out of it. It's all in rolling racks now. Um, but really, primarily, um, I'm either at home. I've got an Atmos or immersive mix room at home. And um, I, I love it there. Um, but also, uh, I've just been doing so much work over at Peter Frampton's studio. He he jokingly calls it my studio. So it's... <laughs> and, and, Peter, I mean, Peter's like such a gearhead. He, uh, every time I come over there, it's like, I'll bring something new and he'll go, Ooh, what's that? And I'll go, yeah. Oh, you got to check this out. And next time I come, he's got it, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, he's really, he's got all the gear that I'd ever want in the world. And, um, when we actually do records together, he's like all his gear and all my gear. I mean, it's just like, it, it's like a toy shop, you know, like it's, you've got I, here, man. Your place is awesome. Thanks, man. That's why, I, you know, it was a friend of mine because I used to go in the mornings to get coffee. I feel like now I make coffee at home a lot of times, but it used to be you get up, you wake out of, wake up, roll out of bed with, you know, shaggy hair, and you just roll right out the door straight to the coffee shop to go pick up your coffee. And then, um, and then I go by the thrift store. <laughs> and kind of see if there was any musical toys or anything in the thrift store. How cool. So I had all this wacky stuff. And and then a buddy of mine, Pat Sansone, had coined the place, uh, the Toy Box Studio, when we were working together. I was like, that's pretty good, you know? Yeah, I love it. I, I keep searching for a name for my studio, and I've, I've got several going. So, you know, it's like every album is a different name, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know you have a... Um, a history with water skiing too, right? So did you ever think of anything that was related to that? You know, like wake. 
you know, it's just so hard. You want it to be somewhat descriptive and, and yet you don't want to box yourself in. And, and, um, <laughs> so I don't know. I just surf studios. Yeah. Right. Surf studios. That's funny. My wife, uh, um, I met her 29 years ago at air studios in London. And, wow. um, congrats on that. Man. Yeah. Yeah. She's, uh, but when she came for the first time for a visit to, to Nashville, um, I had hair down, you know, long hair. And uh, and it was very blonde at the time because I did do a lot of water skiing. So we're flying into Nashville and she's looking out the window and she's going, where's the ocean? And I mean, she just kind of imagined that I lived like on the ocean somewhere, like I was a surfer or something. But <laughs> That's great, man. Well, um, so I'm going to bring this up. Um, there was this wonderful ad that used to show up in, in maybe it was Mix Magazine, stuff like that. It was this picture of you surfing and holding a, um, a oh, Millennium Mike Pre. Yeah. I mean, not surfing, you're water skiing, water skiing. and holding yeah. a Millennium Mike Pre. And it's funny how like, you know, you and I haven't really, this is going to be the longest conversation we've ever, ever had. But when you've been in a place like Nashville for a while, or you've been in, a, in an industry for a while, you begin to kind of sort of create this image of people as you, as you go. So I've, I've carried that image of you, you know, <laughs> water skiing with a Millennium Mike Pre in your hands for for many years. And so my question, of course, is what do you what what piece of expensive studio gear do you uh, water ski with now? <laughs> oh, right. Um, well, you know what? When we actually shot that, I was carrying a um, cardboard box and oh, they photoshopped man. the pre in. Oh, the trickery. <laughs> the know. trickery. It's... Ruined it for you, right? Yeah, you guys. It was really, man, I tell you what, it was really hard. Because I was on a slalom ski, right? And it was really hard to get up because, you you know, I mean, you're used to holding the handle with two hands. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of drag coming up. Um, and, and to have that box and everything, you didn't want it to get, like, soaked. So uh, <laughs> it was You didn't even so... want to hurt the cardboard box. <laughs> right. Well. That's great. You know, I did a little bit of water skiing. And, and I remember, um, you know, the first time you get up on two skis and then you kick one off and then you go on one ski and then you're like, where'd we leave that other ski? And then, uh, and then you try and do it on one ski. And I never, I didn't understand some of the secrets to getting up and you know, the thing where people hunch over and then oh, my yeah. back was just oh, killing me for yeah, days, you know, yeah. plus I was a teenager. So it must've really been like pulling on my back. I, I took, uh, my boat up back home. I grew up in Northern Indiana and, uh, one of my buddies up there was, you know, was a big water skier when we were kids. So I drove up with the boat. It was going to be a family sort of get together. And uh, so one afternoon, us boys went out on the lake and he skied and he skied and he skied. Next day, I mean, he could, he couldn't go to work for like three days after yeah, that. He was just yeah. like destroyed. Yeah. It's, well, it's funny, you know, we're talking about, you know, it seems like that's like, why are we talking about water skiing? It's a, it's a recording podcast, but honestly, that there's some similarities to those, um, particularly the the early experiences of studio life. Um, I remember those first studio sessions. It's like it's it's almost like you have to build up studio muscle. Like those, they really wear you out. It, they can still wear me out now if it's long, long, long days. But you know, I um, you ever you ever notice like you bring in a, a musician who's not used to that studio pace? Yeah, and they're just they just my, mind melts during a session you know it's it's there's so much stress that goes along with it and and just the amount of intense concentration when you're in the studio um you know i think back to the analog days and the how intense it was i mean because you'd be punching in and out all day long and with destructive record right so i mean it's like you miss a punch you've like you know you have a artist on the other side of the glass like just giving you all kinds of hell you know yeah. and so you just didn't miss them you know or if at any rate I, no, at no, the it's end, tough. you have to really be in like high caliber performance mode even at the you know 12th 13th 14th hour when you're exhausted yeah and that you know i mean i even got to the point to where i could fall asleep while i was punching in and wake up in time to punch out it was, <laughs> literally you you know you just you it's a muscle like you said yeah. yeah so so you're talking about um 
being at Peter's place and you guys have all these cool things to try out. It's funny because we live in, a, in an age of software and plugins and people, you know, you, I, in fact, I just bought a bunch more before you walked in. <laughs> I bought a bunch of the universal audio plugins finally for the first time. And, um, and you know, there's the, that the common understanding of the challenge of trying to get to work and, and next thing you know, you're fishing through lists of options. Um, I guess you guys were feeling that as well, even with analog gear sometimes. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we were talking actually before we pushed record, but uh, or maybe it was in our discussion at any rate it, that I generally tend to try something new out all the time yeah. when I'm working. And you learn that you learn from that and, and that you have to store that in your memory banks. And hopefully, you know, when you're trying to come up with a sound, you've got that to fall back on and pull pull from your um, memories and um, I think that's the big you know big important just keep trying things try and keep learning I think keeps you current but also keeps you fresh and um, so yeah I mean that's with with Peter and and analog recording it's just really about the front end you know getting it getting the sound going to tape and then hopefully you don't need all those plugins when you go to mix. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I remember, um, when I was chatting with Steve Albini once, he said something similar where he said, you know, he, he would do a lot of the same things on a session and he'd try to do one new thing every time if he right. could, because you need that reliability to be able to count on all your you know, systems or whatever. But you also need that you got to move forward somehow, you know. That's right? exactly the the thought is, you know, I mean, you you do have to have, know exactly what you're going to do. So you can't, I mean, you can't be wasting time like putting something up and going, oh, that doesn't work. And then put something else up. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's just like, like you said at the beginning of this podcast is it's about capturing the moment. And, uh, but introducing one new thing, you know, I mean, you can learn from that. Yeah. And, I, and I also try and do some, use that, to inspire the musicians like you know maybe it isn't even significant but you know put a new microphone on the acoustic guitar or on the drum overheads or something and and you tell the the musician or the artist about it you know it's like yeah this is this new cool thing and it gets them excited too you know yeah i think that's cool it's a it's a cool thing to hear you say that that including the musician in this new experiment is a smart move in the studio. Yeah. I could see a lot of us being stressed about that. Like, should we even, maybe we shouldn't say anything. We'll just try the new thing, you know, but, I, but it is cool. It's like, um, sessions seem to go great when you sort of bond with the musicians, like it's a shared. Uh, absolutely. Exploration, you know? Yeah. That's what it's all about, man. I mean, uh, they're on, on that side of the glass. They're the ones that are actually important. And, and it's all about you making them feel like they're the most important thing and that you've got control of everything else. And right. so you'll just, you know, forget about my side of the window. We're going to make this happen. And, and you, you know, you put everybody on the other side of the glass up on a pedestal. Yeah, exactly. Um, what are some ways that you found, like, what were some challenges for you about working with an artist where you're, you're trying to make your create this invisibility to the engineering side of what you were doing or the production side, but you felt challenged about it. And then what were some like ways that you found solutions for that? Like, where did you feel like no matter what you, you tried to do, you were still creating some stress for the artist where you didn't want to. Mm, you know, I've been doing it such a long time, you know, I hate to even... You've forgotten, uh, you've forgotten more problems uh, than we'll ever learn. <laughs> things go generally pretty smooth, and, <laughs> and when they don't, you know, I mean, it's 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 just good to kind of like, uh, you know, everybody knows a problem can exist, and, and it's about getting a recording as well as creating music. So, um, you know, everybody's willing to like kind of take a break if you if things just get to the place to where you have to just say, hold on a second, let me sort something out, you know? Yeah. And, and if you can, you know, somehow make light of it, you know, um, 
because I mean, I have seen things where they go terribly wrong and you lose a take or something. Almost inevitably, you go cut it again and it's better. You yeah, know? That's I mean, great so to hear you say that. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I can think of one time in particular where that it wasn't, but I, I was doing a. Yeah, but who knows? Because we never get to hear their well, original. Well, the artist knew. <laughs> uh, uh, we were uh, doing a, um, I think it was Mark Knopfler's uh, Sailing to Philadelphia album. And we had tracked here in the States. And we we got on a plane together and flew over to London and got off the plane. His assistant had left the car there at the airport. And we drove to Bath to uh, um to get Van Morrison's vocal on it. And he had, a, he had, at the time, I'm not sure if he still does, but he had the Tears for Fears studio in Bath. Yeah. So, Seems like a lot of cool artists go to Bath to set up their studios. Yeah, Peter Gabriel. Is it, Chad Blake is in Bath, Chad, I think, Yeah, too. right. Um, well, it's a beautiful, fantastic city, you know. Yeah. But um, at any rate, we get there, and we'd been, this is, goes back a few years, so we were on a Sony 3348, and they didn't have one, so we rented one and had it shipped to Bath and um, delivered, and they had it all set up. And Van's engineer was um, in control of the machine. I was producing with Mark. Um, at any rate, I'll cut it short. But Van, no, no, I'll cut it short. Van, Guess the, you got you get this podcast is yours, man. You can tell any story you want. <laughs> well, this is such a, you know, anyhow, Van only sings at once. I mean, that's his, that's how, that's that's his, his that's what deal. He does. And, and wow. at the outset, the engineer said, he's only going to sing it once. And if you're lucky, you might be able to get him to do, you know, one more, you know, take for pieces. So we wait and we wait and Van gets on the, they actually had a telephone. And he called up to the control room because the control room was on the second story and there wasn't actually a window looking into the studio. So we wait for the phone to ring, phone rings. Okay, I'm ready to go. So we're running this track and he's singing and Mark, there's a window in the control room. I could look over and see Mark. He's just gazing out the window and he's just, you could tell he's just like, oh my God, it's Van Morrison singing on my yeah, record. Yeah. And, and about two thirds of the way through the track, the engineer stops the tape and I just look over at him. He goes, man, I'm just unfamiliar with this machine. I hit rehearse, not record. <laughs> and, oh, no. <laughs> so then why we had... Would, why would there even be such a button? <laughs> I know. Well, it, you, there's, there was a reason. But at any rate, um, I, so I have to get on the phone and tell Van what's going on. He goes, well, give me a minute. Well, that minute turned into like a half an hour or something. Wow. Or lengthy. And... You know, Mark and I are just like, oh, God, I can't believe we lost that, you know. And he says, okay, I'm ready to go. And he sings it again. And it was great. It's Van Morrison, but it wasn't nearly as good. And that's It's amazing to hear a story like that, too, just to be reminded of, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's a, you know, world-class musician who's so pro that they bring their, their absolute A game to that first take – but but I you know it even happens with just indie artists just anybody oh, you know, yeah. there's something like there's something about that um, first thing that people do that's just as Frampton genuine is, as it gets you know Peter is totally like that I mean it's like you make sure you get that first take it's almost always like ninety nine percent there and you just punch in a few bits and pieces you know I mean uh, but yeah the van and and I think that's really something. Because in this day and age where you can just take take after take after take after take and pl create playlists and edit and edit and edit and tune and move and slide things around and get it all perfect, yeah, you know, um, that there's so much artistry that's missed. I mean, because it's not the moment, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the moment really is what you're hoping to get, that that where everything comes together and it's just like, that's one of the Chill things bumps. that I always loved about analog tape tracking sessions. There, and it, it's something that I've I've described. It's this feeling that you're like you're all on this team together, and you're trying to score a goal, right. you know. And it's like there's the the moment has a pinnacle, 
and it's the band's hot. Everybody knows the song, and and you've got your levels right to tape and all that kind of stuff. And then you hit record and you roll it, and you you like you know, a little bit of tension all the way through till the takes over, and you're like, Phew, like nothing broke, the tape machine didn't <laughs> quit, nothing dropped out of record, whatever. You know, <laughs> these days I guess it's you know the computer didn't drop, you know, fire up an error message on the screen and stop recording. <laughs> I guess I guess the computer has its own rehearse button these days. <laughs> oh man! Well, if, with the thirty three forty eight, you know, it was destructive erase. It wasn't right. like you had, you know, it was still tape. And so, if some if you wanted to do a real tight punch, you could create the punch with the rehearse and nudge the ins and outs and yeah. make it perfect so that you could actually. It, it it was a really great feature, but if you didn't know about it, you know. If, <laughs> Adam Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you're setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class full-size studio for professional mixing and mastering in stereo or immersive sound, Featuring the XART tweeter and custom DSP onboard processing, the A-Series monitors will perfectly adapt to your studio. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for you with an extended five-year warranty at atomaudio.com. I just had the the uh, honor of uh, talking to Tom Lord Algae early th earlier this week, and I remember when He's a good dude. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. And when we were going down to mix with him, we had files, and but it was like, well, they need to be on a thirty three forty eight. I think it was is was yeah. what it was in order to be mixed. It was this, the Sony machine, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember so, there was also. So the, I didn't realize Tom was doing that as well as Chris. well at a point. Yeah, yeah. And Chris, I think yeah, yeah, both those guys were doing that kind yeah. of stuff. But it was that you know get it on the right format and everything. And it's just fascinating that, you know, it's, and a part of that I think is also, um, for those guys was, was, um, you know, essentially getting things organized for right. mixing, you know, a lot of recording and making records is getting things organized, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I've certainly have a, a way that I like everything laid out and it's, you know, it, you know, it, it, it comes down to like not having to think so you can yeah. use the other side of your brain to be creative, you know? So what's, um, what's some of your or session organization? Oh, well for me, I mean, it's, it kind of goes back to analog is cause you know, the edge tracks were sort of, you didn't want to put something with a lot of high frequency information on the edge tracks. It could, you know, was generally the worst track. So, yeah. I mean, it was either bass or bass drum on, on, track one I, and I just kind of um, <clears throat> I always start with drums so bass drum snare you know and and I like to try and keep my um, things that are pairs like odd even so 11 12 or you know five six kind right, of thing. Right, right. Um, so which helps in the digital world too because that they they come in as stereo tracks that way right Um and and I actually don't like stereo tracks so much. I generally keep everything mono record tracks. Um, and that way I can, if I need to offset one or yeah. the other, you yeah. know, there's gives you that flexibility. When you say offset, you mean time. offset the level or even just the time? Time, yeah. Even between like overhead mics and stuff? Yeah. Like, oh, man, we got so much fun stuff to talk about. <laughs> Good deal. Um, um, but at, at any rate, so it's like drums, bass, uh, generally keyboards, acoustic instruments, electric instruments, vocals. And, you know, and then if there's like, I mean, if there's like a ton of room mics or samples or stuff like that they generally end up all the way down on the past the vocals <laughs> yeah past where the do vocals. keyboards live so, next to bass next so to bass, drums right. bass keyboards acoustic. and acoustics then 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 electrics, electrics. Uh, yeah I mean, it's, it's just funny. I think, and I, in that way I, I can you know i mean i don't have to think about it too much I, on an analog desk it's all right there in front yeah. of you but even i see that you've got the uh, ssl controllers which yeah, which, which I've those got too. those at home too, and I love them. Um, being able just to scroll through the channels, um, but it, I can see as things group by as they fly by. You know, okay, I'm, I'm in, 
out in the right spot here. It's got to be one or two clicks away. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> one of the things I do is I might highlight a track on the Pro Tools screen and then scroll and then the, then the little white, right. um, yeah. you know, lit up LED button shows up and I'm like, oh, there it is on the yeah on the faders too because I I do um, I love having the digital controllers for being able to bring that console feel back to working in the computer. But one of the challenges is digital controllers tend to, you know, try to, by, by trying to be efficient, they give you eight faders or maybe you've got 16 faders, but you're like, my session's like 30, you know, seven faders or whatever it is. Um, and it's wonderful on a real console, you know exactly where something is, right. but with the digital ones, it's, you know, you're trying to figure out this, how do I know where my fader is? Yeah, there's there's nothing like the feel of a real knob or a real fader. I mean, you just, um, it's you know the continuous control on a on a controller like this software controller is that you, you really don't know because the faster you turn it, the right it might go quickly or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so, true. Whereas that's an analog true. desk, you can just you wouldn't even have to look. You could you know you kind of knew by the feel of it, you know that okay, I'm probably adding about two three dB, you know whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah. What was what was a console that you really loved working on in your time? I mean, you must have worked on a lot of consoles. I'm well, sure. yeah. I mean, I've kind of probably worked on most everything that's come along. But um, yeah, you know, my fave console was a, a Neve eighty sixty eight. I just love the the ten seventy three mic pre's and and you know that that the sound of that thing for tracking is like unbeatable. But I. I came up as the guy who, um, well, we had the first SSL uh, 4000 in Nashville out of the castle. I kind of, I was, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah so we, was, we didn't even really get to talk about your backstory. Yeah. You did school, but you ended up at the castle for quite a long time. Yeah. I was chief engineer out there. And, um, you know, I'd gone to AES and seen, seen the new um, SSL. I had worked on an SSL at um, Kendon Studios in LA and, and so I was familiar with sort of the computer control. That was a like a, I think it was a B. So it had like that desk. It had the oh, yeah. rotary uh, channel select. Yeah, I just the, the SSL just put out the B plugin. Oh yeah, the 4KB, and it's cool. It sounds great. Oh, it was too. a great sounding desk. Yeah, probably the best SSL. Set. Um, but at any rate, so we got we got an E, one of the early E's at the castle, and. Uh, and that's so I just came up on SSLs, um, you know, but I, I, you know, I'd work on Neve V's that were kind of popular at the time. And people would say, oh, man, you mix so much better on a V. Why don't you should be working on a on a Neve? And, you know, and then Knopfler had the uh, 88R. Um, Was that somebody named Bob Solomon? Did you ever work over at a Woodland Studios? Lot? Oh yeah, I knew Bob. Yeah, yeah, for that's sure. where I started. That was my internship. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. So I we can probably even met over there. We did. Know? We did. That totally is now. It's familiar. Yeah, for sure. And I had the long hair too. I, was, I don't know if I looked like a surfer, but um, that was a cool place to start out. And it was just like there were uh, a lot of interesting people coming and going, and that they the eighty sixty eight in there now, right now. And, and I keep calling. And going, hey man, will you rent, rent that out to me? And they just keep <laughs> it as a personal place, you know, her That's and Dave. Cool. So, uh, yeah, I had a Magic Studio, man. They had they had an eighty seventy eight and an eighty sixty eight back in the day. Yeah. Um, and and then they put the fees in. And yeah, when I, I was think, there, it was the I think it was the eighty sixty eight, and I, I mix up which studios. I think that was Studio B, right? The big r tracking space. Um, and then Studio A maybe was the the mix room with the V console V V V R. I think it's vice or, versa. Okay, yeah. maybe it's yeah, vice yeah, versa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. um, but cool stuff. I mean, like while I was there, like Daniel Lenoir came in, yeah. Emily Lou Harris. I don't maybe I don't know if you were working together on any of that stuff. No, um, I didn't work with uh, I've never worked with Daniel Lenoir, but I love his records. So, and uh, yeah, actually, I just. I just picked up that uh, album that they did together um, at, at the used record store. I was having to... Oh, Wrecking Ball? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was having to find some George Strait CDs for... Because um, I'm doing like his catalog in, in Atmos. So um, 
and and they want the timing to be exactly the same on like that's right the stereos so you know finding the cd is very helpful because you can just import the tracks and um and use that as a reference but at any rate i saw the wrecking ball and i just so i was listening to that just a couple of days ago it's that's a, a cool record. sounding record yeah. Isn't it? yeah it was at the time it was like wow that's so cool yeah and then i uh, you know, like um, Bob Seeger, I got to meet him running on the treadmill while that Met record was getting mixed. Oh, wow. and, yeah. He's and such a nice guy. He probably knew like um, uh, Steve Durr and Steve Hennig, those guys and everything were building Studio C there. Right. And that was a cool experience for me. Um, so you you were working on the SSL, the the 4000 at the castle. The cas- Tell us about the castle because that's also a really, really cool place. And I, I had the... Um, fortune to, good fortune to make one record there you know maybe it was like three long days you know all nighter kind of things yeah. with my brother's jazz band we went out and did a record there in the um early 2000s um but it was a very cool place and and it's got a kind of a cool history too well that it's yeah there's a lot of lore about it um at, at any rate it's a, a the it's a building that looks like a castle and it's up on a uh, on a hill and over it used to overlook a bunch of pastures and now they're building up and stuff around there but it is still kind of out in the country a little bit from yeah. nashville proper and um it's just the view out the control room window that if the basically if you're sitting at the desk you're looking through a window into the studio but to the right you had just this picture window looking out over the fields and stuff. It was gorgeous. Um, it, but it was purchased by, a, like a family musician group from Belgium. And, um, they, they bought it thinking that they wanted to immigrate to the U S which they did. Um, and, um, it was, but they paid cash for it and wow. they, and every bit of gear that they'd ever, bought every car they'd ever bought they they paid cash for so when we went to buy the ssl they were going to pay cash for it but they had no credit so i mean ssl was kind of like weird about like well i don't know if we can do this deal (laughs) but they were going to pay cash you know i mean things right or or credit (laughs) but we had um we also besides getting the first sort of automated vca console like that um we also had uh, the first digital machine, which this was before the Sony 3348. We got the uh, 3M digital machine. So um, you might know some of the early Steely Dan records were done on that. And so no, that was, yeah. really, a 3M digital machine. Yeah. Wow, uh, I didn't even I know mean, 3M made a digital machine. I remember Mitsubishi had a big oh, giant this is 32 before, the, thing too. before Mitsubishi, before Sony, that, um, and... It, it, I mean, it was the first sort of practical multi-channel digital machine. Um, but it, the technology was really actually pretty early. I think the filters were analog. So, I mean, every morning you have to come in and and do a distortion, get a distortion analyzer out and al- align it and had to have air conditioning just blowing up on it constantly right, right. and, you know, all, all that stuff. And um but it, it sounded amazing. It was 50 kilohertz sampling rate. And just, it was a great sounding wow, wow. machine. It was just, I mean, when you hit rewind on it, it was so loud. It sa- sounded like a, a jet taking off, you know? So we had to build a special room for it and everything. Did you get, um, you guys didn't. So yeah, I guess early on tape machines would be right in the control room. I think of like, yeah. you know, pictures of criteria and stuff like that. And, and, um, um, yeah. What was the one? Um, there was a, there was a movie called um, ah, what was it? Something Highways or something like that, where they came through Nashville. Some of those studios in the seventies, and you'd fire up the control room, and there's a, little, a nook for the tape machine right yeah. there behind you. But then along came the era of the um, machine room, which well, the kept studios quiet, got more sophisticated. You know, I mean, just as time went on, uh, and you know, it was interesting Nashville. <laughs> I mean, as long as we're talking history, it it, it kind of evolved quicker than anywhere else in that digital world um, because, you know, essentially, there was this producer in town. His name was Jimmy Bowen, and, and he was running uh, 
MCA or Universal at the time. And uh, he had moved from, he produced Frank Sinatra, was kind of his claim to fame. Another one take wonder vocalist. Yeah, exactly. But he had moved to Nashville and he'd kind of been the head at Warner Brothers and at MCA. And I mean, he kind of worked around town, made a lot of enemies as he like would come to a label and fire everybody and bring his team in and then go to another label and fire everybody and wow. bring his team wow. in. But at any rate, he he became very powerful in town. And um, he had a whole team of uh, engineers and assistants and had at least four or five studios leased for a year, you know, on a year on end. And um, so, and I became from the castle, he came out to the castle. I introduced him to uh, digital. And so that's when he kind of basically told everybody, if you want my business, because he had like 70% of the country charts. Wow. Like, wow. So he would tell, all these studios, if you want my business, you have to put an SSL in and you need to put an in, in. And he'd, for some reason, settled on Mitsubishi, which was not the greatest sounding machine. But um, and eventually, then we kind of morphed to the Sony 3348s. But um, Nashville, kind of because of him, he's he said, number one, these musicians are important and I need them to work for me when I need them. So I'm going to pay you double scale. So all these, you know, it kind of raised the pay level, the the quality of the studios all got much better just because he insisted on, you know, certain outboard gear. And this is gear, through the 80s? Huh? This is in the 80s? Yeah. So, well, yeah, the 80s, 90s, early 90s, mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. was kind of his run. Um. And then Tony Brown, who kind of came up, he also had like a, a group of producers that, so Tony Brown came up under uh, Jimmy. And when Jimmy went to Capitol, Tony became sort of head of A&R, um, VP of, of MCA. And, and I had, you know, while Tony was working for Bowen, I was kind of the young hip engineer of the group. And I say that about myself. That's kind of was the reputation. um, And so he, because Tony always liked somebody cool around, you know. Nice. I started working for Tony. So, and then Tony became like the guy in town. So, I mean, I just, luck has it, I just happened to work for those, you know, really powerful producers who seemed to have a, you know, a lot going on. What do you feel like was part of your personality that made you the right fit, the right person for working in those situations? Well, I mean, I was at the time I was the more alternative engineer who was wanting to make new sounds, you right. know, and, you know, I mean, as, as time goes you on, the then, you know, and you age, people think, Oh, he's the old guy, you know, that's like stuck in the past or whatever they think. I don't know. It's always funny what people, how they stereotype you. But, um, I, I've always been kind of somebody interested in trying new things and learning. Um, and, and I, I was not listening to country music. I mean, I'd never had been a fan of country music and, and so Bowen wanted me to work for him because he was looking for new sounds yeah and and tony and that's a was, familiar story i, I hear yeah. that you hear versions of that all the time you right know, in different different genres and stuff yeah i you know so essentially i think that was it you know i mean just kind of i was not really stuck in the past and i was always trying to move forward and and uh, try new things. You know? Now, what about your personality as far as just being a good, you know, engineer well, in the studio too? And all you that? know, you don't make it in the studio unless you're a good hang, you know. I mean, unless, you know, yeah. I mean, I think I have a ton of patience. Um, my wife doesn't think that. But <laughs> <laughs> but I think in, in, in the recording, uh, you know, I love music. I love just I love all the I love all the lights and all the the gear and stuff. That's I mean, great. I just love it. It's like I love the studio. I feel like the studio is a magical place. You know, it's just like you know, and and I love hearing music being created. Um, so you know, I mean, you just, 
And then I probably you know, helps if you like musicians too, right? <laughs> well, I love musicians. Yeah. I mean, general, I mean, generally the kind of person that it takes to be a musician, they're a little off center, you know? Right, right. And just and, like us. But they also are passionate about things, you know? I mean, they're seriously passionate and they also uh, have a lot of heart generally because, you know, you, it's an emotional thing to make music. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, there's all different kinds of engineers, producers, musicians, but um, I think some of those qualities are necessary. You know? Yeah, you, you talked about getting to the point where you just you don't project stress on a situation right. a, on a session is what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, and that's that's an important thing. And I remember hearing again talking about like all these stories you hear as you're coming up. So. Me, I would hear stories about, I, you know, I probably heard stories about you, you know, it was probably like somebody probably said like, oh yeah, you know, like, you know, somebody who like Chuck is on a session, things go wrong and they're just like, oh, it'll be fine. We'll work out. And I'm, you know, here I am the young guy. I'm like, how do you, how can you be so zen about it? Right? I'm stressing out just thinking about, you know, setting up a microphone or whatever. You know, the best, the best that that was Ed Journey. I mean, he, if anything was going wrong, I mean, we, I was fortunate enough to be friends with Ed and we would hang a lot when he'd come to town or if I was in LA, we'd hang. I, you know, Rose would, um, his wife ran the record plant, but she also was, I mean, they're just great people and they will come stay at the house, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but Eddie, man, he just, if something wasn't happening, he'd just break out a story or, and everybody be on the floor laughing, you know, I mean, he That's just crazy. had a way of making everything so easy going and like, but, but at the same time, this is really serious. We're making really good shit here, man. I yeah. mean, you know? So yeah. somehow he could repair the console while he's also telling a funny story. Or, or the tech guy comes in and deals with it and he's, you know, he's like keeping everybody entertained and yeah. nobody, you know, just, and, and like I said before, I mean, most people understand that stuff happens and, and these, the, the breed of, musician that that is a studio musician i mean they're just special people because they yeah. you know if, if it's not time to record right now they'll go out in the lounge and like make a cup of coffee or you know they just shoot the shit and and then when they're when it's time to record they're back on it like that i mean yeah. it's you know i mean like nothing ever happened you know plus i mean it's like where else are they going to be Right, <laughs> exactly, and they're Stu also getting paid a lot of studios, money. <laughs> yeah, studios in the name, right? So right. It's in the title, studio musician. I know you do a lot more sort of um, like bands, like rock bands. Well, and I've done, you know, be, growing up in Nashville, like you, I came here, and I, I didn't. Country wasn't a thing for me. I mean, I didn't yeah. even, uh, you know, I just came down because MTSU, Middle Tennessee, had this great program, right? And I went down there to go to school. Still do. Yeah, still do. Yeah. And um, and in fact, I just had Dan Pfeiffer on the show oh, as a cool. guest, which was really cool. And, um, and you know, didn't have any interest in the country music scene, really. But then I started at Woodland, and I started crossing paths with him. And then I just discovered, you're like, wow, this is whole, this is amazing. You know, there's like, there's the musicians, the songwriting, the music, all of it, you know, and then yeah. and getting a chance even to listen to your discography and go through and listen to the sound quality of all these records too. It's, it's, it's just such a cool thing. You know, the, the experience of choosing to do this and then being exposed to different kinds of music that maybe as a, as a, just a music fan, you didn't gravitate towards initially, but as a producer and an engineer, you begin to really appreciate this this craft of making records yeah. and the different styles and the different ways and the completely, you know, I make this sound over here, but there's this completely other way of making a sound. And then you appreciate it and you're like, wow, I want to, I want to learn how to do that too. Right. Uh, and you know, I mean, like somebody might be familiar with you because of a record they heard and knew that you did it and they might, and, and ju you just get stereotyped as the guy who does that. Um, and, and yet, you know, you've got, such a huge palette you can really do all these other things you yeah know? yeah um i i when i first started working with martin offler well not when i first started working with him but with him 
as a solo artist, we'd done some Dire Straits stuff together, and and then um, he wanted to do a solo album, and uh, so he called me up and he said, "I'm thinking about using these guys. What do you think?" And and um, his publisher had told him that Glenn Wharf was like this great uh, upright bass player, yeah. and um, and I knew that Glenn played great upright bass, so I was like totally cool with that. Um, and we went in, we cut this one song, it was this monstrosity of a of an idea that Mark had. Um, it's called Speedway to Nazareth. And we ended up cutting that song several times before we were happy enough with it to put it out on, on a record. And even still, then he morphed that song live and it became something even greater. But But the first recording was almost like a bluegrass record. Um, like Sam Bush was on it, and I can't remember who all was on it, but it was a lot of bluegrassers. Harry Stinson was playing drums, and and we decided that that wasn't the direction, you know. Um, and so the next time Mark came to town, he wanted to put together a different band, and so it was like Michael Rhodes because he, you know, Michael Rhodes, yeah, another great, great bass player, electric yeah. bass player, yeah. and and he kind of Mark had moved on from. Glenn because he just thought of him as an upright player. Well, then years, you know, a year or two later when we're doing another record, he, or it was probably even that, that first solo album, we decided to kind of change up things. Um, and we went with Glenn and then, and Glenn has played bass for Mark ever since. I mean, yeah. live studio. I mean, yeah, he plays, he's not just yeah. upright though. He plays electric as well. Oh right? yeah. He's, but, but the, the point being is that Mark just had pigeonholed him as an upright player, you know, didn't realize he was this great electric. It's player. easy to do. We see, we see yeah. people doing a thing and then that's what we think of for a while. Yeah. The funny thing is the bass player in my band, um, at one point he bought, I think it was a Warwick thumb bass that I think he got from Glenn. Uh -huh. Or maybe it was like his old bass or something right. like that. It was, it was fascinating. It was a, a fretless too, so it makes oh, sense. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Howdy, rock stars. I've got a secret to tell you about how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars. My secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX Breath Control, D Click, D Clip, DS. Deplosive, voice denoise, ozone multiband compression, neutron EQ, and limiting, all from Isotope. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off. Okay, cool. Well, so uh, let me backtrack a little bit. I'm sorry, um, I can take you down a lot of No, it's all right. There's so much fun <laughs> stuff to talk about. Um, one thing I'll mention right away, you you were talking about Peter Frampton's studio and the stuff you guys do there. Now, you've, you've worked in many of his studios for years, right? Well, he and I have a pretty long track record together. Um, he had a uh, when I first started working with him was here in Nashville, and I can't remember where. I was. I know we did some stuff at Soundstage. Um, trying to remember, I know that we worked. I think we did some stuff at uh, Sound Emporium and worked at a number of different places. Yeah. Um, but then he ended up moving to Cincinnati and put a studio in his house there. His wife was from there, and she wanted to be close to family and. So he put a studio in there. It was a really nice studio, but to so that to, was moving from Nashville to Cincinnati, right? Was this like um, '90s, late '90s, or something like that? Man, challenge me. I'm getting. Uh, I I'm would getting, say at I least got a point. late I, '90s. You know, I got this is a early loaded 2000s, question. Thousands, probably. Yeah. This is a loaded question because um, do you remember him having a studio with a sort of a swirly green? rack credenza in the studio does that sound familiar i know that he had a studio here in town but i never worked at it okay all right so so what i'm getting at is my buddy chris james who's also been on the show now he went on to become prince's engineer oh yeah he uh many years ago he was like hey man you need a rack for your studio and i was like oh hey, what do you got you know and it was and it turns out it was peter frampton's swirly green cr credenza oh. rack 
um, that was being, you know, just given away as he was moving from one studio to right. another. And I still have it. It's still up in the house in my, oh, in awesome. my basement now. It, is, uh, it doubles as my workshop. Well, you should get him to sign it. There you <laughs> go. That's what I need to do, right? So anyway, all right. A long, long he, one. He, he, just speaking of, he had a really great studio up there in Cincinnati in his house. And we did a couple of records there. One of them got a Grammy um, for best pop instrumental right on um yeah and but then he and that wife split up and he decided to move back to nashville kind of be more around the music scene here and um so <laughs> amazingly enough he actually found somebody that wanted to buy his house it's a big house so that's number one but that actually wanted a studio with an ssl in it too so right. oh that's what was up in cincinnati yeah, at the time. yeah so so then he found a studio here there's kind of an area where there's a lot of studios like blackbird and so yeah, forth barry hill barry hill so he found a studio in barry hill that was owned by um um richard landis a producer from that was he produced her his claim to fame was juice newton but he produced a lot of the sort of country artists too. Um, and uh, anyhow, so here was the studio. Richard was looking to get out of the business and it had an SSL. So we started working there. Peter called me up, had me come over and I was like, he wanted me to mix something. And I, so the first thing was like, man, it's not sounding right. You know, so I started like checking out every channel was like different, you know, it was obviously the thing was old and in bad shape. And this is the SSL, recapped. the, the yeah. Newberry Hill studio. So it just, the maintenance. Yeah. It just you, been let go, you know? And so Peter's going, man, my, the SSL I had up in Cincinnati was a lot better than this one, <laughs> which it was. So we, we had it all completely recapped and new switches and just completely gone through. Now it's, it's awesome. That's cool. When I was at Woodland, I was a tech intern. And one of the things I got to do, um, the, the tech there was a guy named John McGriff. I don't know if that uh -huh. name would sound yeah, familiar yeah. to you, but he, you know, he guided me through taking the knee VR apart and recapping stuff. Which you had to do that was a, too. Yeah. yeah, it was a fun, <laughs> I mean, it was just so cool to, to get an ex, a chance to learn stuff like that and, and, yeah. Dig into the tech. Did you find yourself getting into some of the, the tech side of things too? Or were you always in a place where somebody had that handled so you just didn't really have the, the need to I mean, to learn I could it? swap out a, you know, a chip here or there knowing that that was probably the problem. But I was I never really got deep into it. I mean, I did a lot of soldering and wiring. Yeah, that's kind of what I mean. You know, you, you know. build studios. Yeah. I've built a number of them. But I, no, I kind of didn't go quite that deep into the tech side of things. The building studio stuff, though, is so great when, especially when you start, I found, because it just really gave me an understanding of, like, what the hell's going on behind all these racks? Yeah. And, you know, what what is that patch bay there? And how do these cables go together? And, like, what's inside that cable and connector and all that? Well, it's, it's so helpful for, as you, like, now we're all building our own home studios and how to lay it out and do it where it's, actually makes sense and yeah and now works. you gotta wear all the hats right <laughs> yeah right yeah. Uh, now are you a musician too i started out a drummer and um you know sort of junior high i kind of like you know I, you know the main thing about being a musician is you wanted to you know chase after the girls so <laughs> <laughs> uh, guitar was like a cooler instrument so i started playing guitar and you know, played in bands all through high school, um, moved to Nashville after a year at Indiana University. I, I kind of studied music there. And also there was a, in Bloomington, uh, Indiana, where, in, where IU is, is there was yeah. a studio called Guilfoy and, and they had a little program that I enrolled in and that's where I was just like, okay, this is what I want to do. Um, and so after that year at IU, I moved to Nashville because Belmont had just started with their music business program. Which I mean, is it's a great. The, the second year that it's, they isn't it funny. All the schools seem to start with music business programs. Well, like, yeah, you know, I mean, the, but you go there to learn to make a record. Mom and dad will pay for the business part <laughs> I think of it, that's right? Why it was. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, yeah. So mom and dad liked the idea that I was going to go to a business school, and I liked the idea that they had a studio. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I did that for like a year and a half. And I, I just, I was in the studio constantly. And there was only, I mean, there was only 25 students in the music business program when I was there. So it was like really the infancy. It was the first of its kind yeah. too, you know? So, um, yeah, I think I remember seeing that studio in under downstairs under the building yeah, kind of studio. And then, like, now, of course, Belmont just owns all the studios. Oh you know, my gosh! And I would, we uh, will probably end up talking about it. But I just had my uh, group Met Alliance in town. We we did a we went to the your school MTSU and did a lecture there, and then we went to Belmont. They've got like a big like a theater. Um, for Atmos, um, mixed yeah, stage room. I've seen it. Just and, uh, twenty speakers so we did, in the we ceiling did some or something. Atmos right? playback or immersive playback in there, and um, talked about that to the Belmont students. And then we had um, Blackbird Studios rented out all four, like four of their studios rented out for the weekend, and had um, what we call in session. Um, so Elliot Shiner and myself were in one room. We had a had the pro studio musicians with uh, John Randall, a great singer, songwriter, producer himself, um, and, and this like killer all star session musicians. Um, and then Jimmy Douglas was in um, one of the rooms doing, uh, uh, he was mixing uh, Timberlake stuff in Atmos. Oh, right on. And Sylvia Massey and Nico Bolas were in another room. They were doing more alternative artists. Yeah tracking in in a, the other in studio a and george masterberg and frank filippetti were in george the room that george designed is the most it's the oddest looking thing you've ever seen in your life um he could tell you all about it but it essentially it's he came up with this idea of using so much dispersion that it actually created a dead room so it's actually deader than an anechoic chamber but it doesn't have that ear sucking thing. Yeah. The RT time is so short in there. But at any rate, so that's what we did. And and we had like um I think about 40 um attendees and each group kind of went around to you know would spend like four hours with with me and Elliot and move on. You know, so throughout the weekend they got to spend four hours with each one of us. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that room is really cool. I, for some reason, I always like to think of it as the inverted Death Star. It's like <laughs> I think I think I remember when you when they would fly up close to the Death Star, you saw all these these oh, um, right. aerials poking off it and everything. And I and if you like reversed it, they were all coming inside. And that's the 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 George Massenberg room over there. Well, at it's, it's so bizarre. I mean, visually, because it like for me, my eyes don't know what to focus on. You know, yeah. it's, it's the depth of all those little pieces. You, your eyes just can't focus. And so, if you look at somebody next to the wall, you can't hardly figure out how far away they are from wow, you because wow. it's just got this real death, d- um, diffuse depth perception. in everything. You know, yeah. and and when I interviewed Mark Rubel, we were in that. We did the interview in that oh, room. Cool. And he said that. I bet that, your podcast sounded really good. It did sound really good. I mean, you know, he's he's um, somebody listened and they were like, "Man, he just sounds like the nicest guy in the world." He know? is. He is. Yeah. And um, and Mark was saying that uh, there was a blind musician in there too, and and they couldn't get the natural. They have a normal like echolocation sense of how close the wall is. Yeah, but they couldn't get it because of the diffusion too. Yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting place for sure. Yeah. It also well, sounds incredible in there, and and so they have a, they have, um, a ATC Atmos, um, playback yeah. system in one direction, and then in the other direction, they've got a Genelec Sony three hundred and sixty. Oh, cool. which so, is Frank. That's what Frank's really into, right? Right. And so we were lucky enough. I know this is taking you way off track, but they had just installed their latest. Uh, it's it's a desktop app that does immersive playback, so it, it can do 360 playback, but it can do Atmos playback. It can, and and so they have a way of analyzing uh, your ears to and do a, get an HRTF for your personal hearing, and they've analyzed the room, and they've got these new headphones. So I can say all this by the time this podcast is released it will be a real thing that's exciting man. yeah and man i'm telling you you put the headphones on 
and you take them off and it's it's like you really it's like you're hearing the speakers it was wow. it's the best the best immersive experience i've heard besides listening to real speakers so so rock stars everybody who's been on the guest who might have poo-pooed atmos at one point or another take that <laughs> yeah i mean hey I, you know the, what i think so cool about it i mean besides it being it it actually works is like you could now mix in headphones and have the same sound as that room that they analyzed and they're gonna like i know that i know that they're doing um skywalker because leslie ann jones told me that she's my co-chair on the p and e wing um so she she i know they're doing that room but they've done blackburn i'm sure they'll do like some of the other like great control rooms hopefully capital or something like that and so you could like as long as your ears you have the HRTF analyzed for your hearing. You put that in the player and you can like work as though you're in Blackbird or in Skywalker or. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to talk more about that. OWC is your one stop shop for flexible drive storage and connectivity solutions for your studio. The Mini Stack STX for your Mac Mini adds two additional drives over a universal SATA HDD SSD bay and an NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD, plus three additional Thunderbolt USB C ports. The OWC Thunder Bay 4 chassis, built like a tank, gives you four hot swappable two and a half inch. RAID configurable drive bays, plus an extra Thunderbolt 3 jack for daisy chaining up to five devices. Or check out the OWC Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock with two RAID configurable drives and seven ports of connectivity, including a front side SD card reader, one gig ethernet, two USB 3.2 ports, a dedicated display port, and an additional backward compatible Thunderbolt port. Get your studio connected with the mini stack SD STX, Thunder Bay 4, and Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Use the custom link in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session, aka the second half of the show, aka I'm not sure why I call it any name at all. It's just the second half of the show. It's awesome. My guest today is Chuck Ainley, joining us here at the Toy Box Studio and Recording Studio. Rockstars, Chuck, are you ready to jam? Uh, yeah, I'd rather jam. Let's jam. <laughs> all right, cool. So let's just dive right into that. That is so freaking cool to hear you say that the headphone experience is that exciting. So I'm, I'm going to preface this a little bit and say that one of the challenges that I hear discussed on this podcast in particular is the concept of the immersive audio. You know, where's it going? What does it mean? What does it mean if people don't have, if they can't experience the same sound with all the speakers in a well-done room and everything? And I kept thinking, yeah, but, you know, this, this ability to mimic that with binaural listening and headphones, it has a lot of potential if it can, if it can happen. And so talk a little bit more about that because it sounds like that is getting figured out. And and I like to think that like what hasn't been figured out, like, come on, it's going to get figured out too, right? Well, number one, to begin with, back in the 5-1 days, um, which I, I did a lot of 5-1 mixing, um, th I remember going to a, a consumer electronics show and and... <laughs> Massenburg could tell you the name of these guys. I, I forget their name, but there was two guys, and they had developed um, a way of testing your ears. And they they had headphones with a infrared sensor on them. So as soon as you took the headphones off, it would switch to the speakers. You put the headphones yeah, on cool. and switch. And they really had it nailed. But it, I mean, it was like this mainframe computer and and uh, and everything. And they tried to at some Point, tried to take it commercial and I don't think it was ever successful but um that's I knew that the experience could work um and Sony is finally kind of they a year or so ago they did tested did the HRTF on my hearing and and it was pretty good 
but now they've really got it. Um, I mean, it is just a slight collapse in depth. But I mean, I literally the the way they do the testing is you'll you hear the sort of this person announce, okay, we're they put these little microphones in your ears and okay, we're about to do the test, and then you hear this pink noise burst, and, and then you hear the little sort of whoop, whoop, whoop. Out yeah, of, it reminds each, me of the um, Sonarworks reference for when you're setting up your speakers. And right, does yeah. Stuff. So it does that out of each speaker, and and that's where they get the HRTF. Um, and HRTF is like head, head phone, <laughs> or head function response transfer or something like that. You know? Yeah, it may, it may be, something I mean, along those I, I might even have the wrong letters, but, um, but it essentially it's measuring. It's, so, so because everybody's depth of their ear, the shape of their head, the width, you know, all of that has to be taken into consideration. Wait, what do you mean? You saying we're all different? We're all different. <laughs> right. So, but all that has to be taken into consideration in, in making the binaural work properly. Yeah. So once you've been, once you have that listening test and, um, and they've refined that since the last time I did it. So they had to do that again and then they can analyze the room, get all that spatial information and they have a known quantity with these new headphones that they've developed, which are actually excellent sounding headphones. They're, they're open back headphones. They sounded very natural. They were light. You know, I mean, something you could probably wear all day long, you know. Nice. And um, didn't sound like your typical um, Sony headphones, let's put it that way. Um, and... And it was just, I mean, there was a slight collapse, but I put the headphones on when they did the, the test with the headphones on. It's the same thing. You hear the announcement out the center channel speaker, and I thought I heard the pink noise out of the center channel speaker, but it was actually, after they did the test, I took the headphones off, and I go, now, wait a second. Was the announcement the center channel speaker and the pink noise? They said the announcement was, but the pink noise came from inside the headphones and i totally blew my mind oh in other words i thought, you thought it was literally out there it was in the, room. the speaker and then we just did some listening tests to music and um yeah yeah i was really impressed so so the, so, so the cool thing is yeah. here's for me not only do you have that as a real reference that people because right now you shouldn't try mixing in headphones it's you know the technology is moving so rapidly that what you think that you're doing to make the headphones work now is going to be so different a year from now that your mixes are going to not sound good. So I'm I'm only going to counter that to say that to encourage the rock stars to start now because there's a lot of the process of how to mix an immersive and objects and stuff that might be worth. Yeah, I mean you can the learn tools. the technology, I, mean, I suppose, yeah. but it's it's you know making making judgments in right. binaural right is is they won't they won't add up you, later yeah is what i mean it's, if you're gonna mix you still need speakers in a properly set up room that's you know i mean it's it's not you can get into it you, it's not that expensive to get into that you know there's some really great speakers and there's good multi-channel monitor systems and and uh you know you can set up a room fairly reasonably and but that's really the way to do it I, yeah. I know there's a lot of people that are mixing in headphones and and i've been part of the immersive um the nominating committee for the grammys and, oh, great. and you listen and i've done that for years you know um but you listen to stuff and you can just tell it was done in headphones it's just so wrong that's you know and yeah. and and then and there's so the but percentage but of really good at most or immersive mixes is really quite small. So, right, right. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's new. It's just still so yeah, brand new. People are still learning it's and figuring it out. Yeah. But it, what's exciting is knowing that what's coming is more of a universal experience. So that because how amazing it will be if your experience. I mean, just just the fact alone that headphones might become a really usable reference that way means that anybody like really like the the home studio experience will be potentially equivalent to yeah i think the, down know, the road it's going to be 
that's going to make it more available to more people. But also, our biggest challenge really is how do you get the artists to hear the mix? You know, you can't get them to fly to town and listen to right. a properly set up room. How do you get them to hear it to make, you know, any kind of real judgment about whether it's good or not? And that's, I think that's partially why there's so much bad stuff. You know, I mean, there's a lot of greed at the labels, particularly one um, where they're just shoving out stuff done by, you know, people with not very much experience, um, you know, asking them to mix multiple songs a day. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, things that, you know, like classic records that probably, like Ellie would say, you know, they might have worked a week on on one of those Steely Dan records, you know. And yet, you know, I'm just using this as an example, right, right, but right. they'd be at, you know, the the engineer would be asked to mix two or three of those a day, you know, and it's, and then essentially what they're doing is, well, if anybody hears it, like the artist hears it and, and says, that's not good. Well, they'll go back, they'll pay to have it redone, but they're banking on the fact that they're not going to care or not, you know, so they can just shove more and more stuff out the door. Yeah. I, I, it pisses me off. And, and that, cause I mean, probably a lot of your listeners are a little, um, uh, you know, disenfranchised by the whole experience because it doesn't sound good. You well, know? this is, you know, the term, the vocal, well, folk minority, in this case, you know, the, the emergence of immersive might be a vocal majority because a lot of people, you know, are trying to experience this new thing. And there's the, there's the disconnects between the, intent of what's being created and how it translates. And then like what you said, there's always that classic um, push and pull between the industry business side of what right. we do and the artistry yeah. and, you know, where that, where that sweet spot is. But let's, let's keep talking about the, the exciting part. Oh, well, so the exciting part for me, I mean, uh, number one, I love immersive mixing. It's just, it, it gives you so many more options and landscape and, um, you know, the, the idea of like actually envisioning a record to begin with that, that it's going to be recorded to work in this environment, yeah. you know, not just yeah. catalog material that's being, you know, you know, mono tracks being panned around and stuff like that, but actual immersive, like pickup of things and, and creating the recording process through too. the yeah, recording, yeah. you know, yeah. ambient miking and so forth to create that reality in this space is is really really cool i i it's actually a couple of years old now but i did a in 2019 i was kind of thinking ahead about the emergence of of this you know atmos and so i did an album on lyle love it and it was like you know a lot of live players in the room at at a time, you know, I mean, we had horns, background vocals. This is Chuck Ainley and his very large mix. <laughs> yeah, right. His very <laughs> large mix. Um, but that was, that anyway, was a reference to uh, to uh, Lyle Lovett and his very large band, Rock Stars. Right. If you didn't know. So, uh, so at any rate, we um, did this, and and I used a lot of ambient miking, and I also placed a lot of musicians in the same room together, so that the bleed from each instrument would kind of like be as though you had ambient miking as well, you know, and, and, and when I did the, the immersive mix of that record, you know, I mean, number one, Lyle said basically no reverb. So for the stereo record or the, there's, I mean, just a tinkling of, of reverb in there, but right. it's, it's pretty much dry. So it's, it's just ambience, you know, and, um, it's, it's so effective uh you really feel like you're in that space and the musicians are all like you're in the middle of all these musicians and they're and which was the idea you know we that's actually pretty cool. tried then, to do that and so when you think about it how do you like to start visualizing you said you're in the middle of the space of the musicians so there's i guess a question that comes to mind is are you sitting in an audience seat with a band in front of you or do you sort of sit up on stage now or are those even the right questions? Well, it is in a sense. I mean, um, I don't necessarily think of a studio recording as a stage recording, um, but if when you when you do have a live performance or you have a visual, like you actually have 
video that is focusing your attention to the front and then it becomes a different thing. I mean, I, I, I mean, some guys are feel okay about putting something really discreetly in the back, even though the imagery is in the front. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a harder time with that. So it's more about, um, making the sound stage be wide and wrap around you, but what's behind you is more ambient. Um, so, or, and, and if you're, if it is a concert, you know, obviously you're in the middle of the audience. So you have audience all around you. I, I did a, been doing a, some Peter Frampton live stuff. And, yeah. I was just going to say, do we have to wait for the 45th anniversary no. for the immersive? Well, experience? it may come up, but it, I mean, you can't, you, if you told us now, you'd have to kill me after this. So right, you, can, you can just I, let I it be a surprise. Say, but, I mean, it may come up, but, um, the, the, uh, I've been doing some of his more recent tours and, and he's like, you can almost reach over there and touch the guy who's like being obnoxiously loud, right. you know, <laughs> or the girl who's like, yeah. you know, go, ah, I got that high screaming. I mean, it's really cool to be in that space, but in, in a studio recording, I, f I don't feel that encumbered by like having to keep it more front loaded. I mean, I feel like I want to look at the, I want to look at the vocalists in front of me, the lead vocalist. Mm -hmm. And I, kind of feel like you know just from practicality from the fact that you know um in in most systems the front is gonna have the better speakers probably right like right and a lot of a lot of the instances with this you know it might even be a sound bar so what's behind you is is um may just be projected in and and um or or just not as efficient of speakers so so I tend to put like the drums in front, bass in front, but that I tend to wrap them around with, you know, ambient space behind you. But then I, I feel less like encumbered by like keeping backgrounds in front. They might be in back or the horns like might be in back or the, you know, guitars spread around. And I like the idea. I mean, one thing with immersive is you got to keep the audio moving, whether it be interaction between players that creates this movement or actual panning. Your ears tend to kind of, uh, you know, normalize to the sound field a after a while. And the, you're not as attracted to the rear speakers after a while so interesting That's um, fascinating. Keep, yeah. keeping sort of the audio moving and and i hopefully it's through musician interaction you just try and pan things so that you know somebody plays something up in the front left and then somebody answers that in the right rear you know mm -hmm, i mean mm -hmm. so things kind of move around well what it, what you're getting at is what was coming to mind for me too that when we think about this surround stuff we have to remember that just no matter what the technology is and what the ability is, we're still having a human experience and a human experience yeah. is about attention. And it's like, what am I paying? Just like a, knowing how to mix and and making sure that you're, you're making it easy, maybe easy for the listener to know what part are they supposed to be paying attention to in this mix at this time? It's a little bit like that for immersive too. It's like, if you're good, just because you, well, I'm not even going to say that just because you can put something in all these different locations, but you still have to make an artistic decision. Are you drawing attention to a different location at that point in time? And how does that all add up musically? Right. And, and the hardest thing with it obviously is, is trying to just keep the groove. I mean, right. you know, <laughs> plus it, you got the whole band. Yeah, thing. It, I mean, it can Will it make Some you of dance? these things just sound like it's a sound effect, you know, I right. mean, it's something panning all around the speakers and, you know, I mean, and, and the whole point of the record, the heart and soul and the, the groove is missing. So that that's number one. You can't lose that. And, and you also don't want to expose like not great musicianship too, which stereo is so great there's certain things you can just hide i mean i yeah. can't even imagine like some of the rolling stone records you know you spread that all out and you go oh gosh you know <laughs> <laughs> but wow um amazing so with this idea that we can 
mix and headphones. And I feel like it's worth a little bit more describing so people understand it. Because our heads are all different, um, we, we share similarities. So you got a left ear and a right ear. I do too. Our heads generally pretty close to the same size, but you know, we're all a little different sizes. But but also our just our ears, the pinea of our ear, we all have these unique shapes. And what's fascinating to me is to learn that our own experience of locating a sound has to do with the way that all these things add up. So the way that the sound arrives at our left and our right ear at different times slightly, the way it filters through actually our skull, you know, like maybe if I'm a, maybe if I'm a little bit empty headed, maybe it's <laughs> comes through my head a little different than the next guy, you know, but also like the shape of our ear itself, it does a comb filtering effect. So it's almost like in a way the sound is kind of fucked up by the time it arrives at your eardrum, but our brains are so smart that they know how to, that, that our brain knows how to interpret that and, you know, reprocess that into, um, like decompile it into a, an understanding of what's going yeah, so on around us. Here's an easy way. Like we, we also have two eyes, right? So try closing one eye and, and look at I'm your depth. I'm doing it right now, Rockstar. Okay, You're on podcast, I'm doing it so I have too. To tell you that. <laughs> and look at your depth perception. So and and just start and study the depth perception with just one eye. It's it's pretty much flat, right? Yeah. It's it's like it's hard to tell how far away something is. I Should mean, I close my good eye or my bad eye? <laughs> I, to, I close my bad eye. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and then as soon as you open your other eye, you you notice. Okay, I, I can figure that out. You. If, your vision is the same as your ears. It uses it uses the two different sources, and then the brain figures out how to put that all together. And and so the ears are like like you said. You mentioned timing, you uh, phase between the sound arriving at one ear and then the other. The comb filtering from your your head shape and all that. So there there has to be that known quantity. Um, the at the moment, Apple's does something with their iPhone where you can use the infrared that, that sort of like figures out your facial recognition. Right. So they, it, they, they have, can look at your ear too, right? Is yeah. So basically, you, you like have it scan your face, then you have it scan your right ear, then you have it scan your left ear, and it comes up with a sort of, um, you know understanding of your head and the headphones the over ear headphones the the pod pros or whatever they're called and they basically have measurement capability of your your phone sends that directly to the new world order so that they (laughs) (laughs) so they're figuring all this out on us right (laughs) well they might be you know they might be gathering information so they can make this experience better and i and and it will get better it will get better yeah um, at the moment, the Sony thing, you basically have to go in and get get a real test done. And th- I yeah. think that's the most reliable thing. And they'll probably, you know, there'll be places, you know, studios set up where you can go get your ears tested and be able to use At the mall. App. It'll be yeah. at the mall. You just but go I, into a you know, kiosk, I, right? I can imagine having, like, say, George Strait. I'm doing a bunch of his catalog work, which is, is uh, amazing for me. I'm not doing it, like, the label wants me to do it where I do it really quick and cheap. I'm, I'm charging and I'm, I'm taking my time to do it. Well, we want those lessons, but tell us how to, tell us how to make a living doing what we do too. Well, when you get uh, there, yeah, but at at, at any rate, you know, um, so that's something like 36 albums. I mean, I'll be doing it until I'm ready to quit. Wow. Wow. So, um, that ought to be a lot of fun too. Some great records. Oh, there's some great records and great musicianship. I mean, I'm at the moment I'm doing um, oceanfront property and and I'm listening to the record and it's it's this era, and I won't mention names, but where the producer was expecting this like sort of I don't know. It was, he was all into the Quantec room simulator, which was a terrible sounding sort of room space sound, and all it, all these sort of like he had this philosophy, and I, and I'll just leave it at that. But it's some of the worst sounding reverbs, and so I'm just. <laughs> I thought I was mixing up the worst sounding reverbs. So I'm I'm I, 
You've got a Bricasti, so I mean, uh, I no, think, no, I don't. Oh, no. where did I, I, I thought I saw a Bricasti. Did I not? No, maybe the Tegler audio stuff. Oh, uh, you know, like I was just over at a studio yesterday, and that's what I'm envisioning. Um, but I'll, I'll pretend that I have one. I love that thing, man. Um, Frampton's got two of them. Above your is, head uh, in the closet upstairs is an Echo Plate Two from the seventies. Oh, so that right. counts. That's a great sound and yeah. reverb. So at any rate, um. I'm envisioning having like George come to Blackbird and have his ears done. And then I can just, you know, oh, get him some great. headphones and that way he can hear this stuff for real, you know. But I'm going to have to call him up and say, I'm going to make this record slightly different from the original. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that's cool. So let me circle back to okay. one of the things you said about the vocalist being in front of you. So one thing that's different about mixing in stereo is now all of a sudden we've also got a center speaker, right? So how how are some ways to think about how it can be smart to use that center speaker? And do do we even think about it like that? Do we actually send the, a vocal to the center speaker? Or is that sort of blended into the left-right up front? Well, how, how does just that the general rule is um, when you have multiple sources, um, feeding the same sound into the room it causes phase shifts stereo causes phase shifts so you know i right. mean if you put a, have a phantom center basically you have the same um level coming out of each left and right speaker but it also causes some phase shifts so that's why there's sort of a notch in the 5k region um so when you all of a sudden put that vocal in a center speaker, that's only one source, so it doesn't do that same thing. And so it can be like the microphones that we've decided are great microphones, the, you know, AKG C12 or the U47 or 251 or 67, they kind of, a 57 is a perfect example. They have a boost at 5K and 10K to kind of accommodate what happens in a phantom center. I mean, we end wow. up liking that sound better because that's the way we're hearing, right? Yeah, so no, we go, I've... well, that's that's that mic sounds better on the vocal. Not thinking, well, it's actually a phase shift that's happening between the left and right speakers. It's like putting a notch in there. So, so okay, that's rule number one. You're going to hear something different out of the center channel speaker than a phantom center. I mean, we've all... I mean, I've become very accustomed to hearing a vocal and a snare drum as a phantom image. So what I tend to do is I tend to use divergence to make it more of a, um, a phantom image. And then I bleed in some of the center channel to give a strong center imagery. I've kind of just one kind of rule of thumb is that if you're going to do that, the center channel ought to be at least 6 dB down from the left and right, or else you start getting this comb filtering problem. Hmm. Um, but, you, you know, it's, it's a matter of taste, right? So, you know, I one thing I love about immersive is there are some rules, but there aren't. there's also a lot of give and take, and it's time right. for us to all learn and make something, you know, where somebody's going to make that great record and you're going to go, what? did they do you know i mean yeah. how many times did that happen throughout your career where you heard a record and go what was that and then you tried to figure it out and 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 uh you know that's kind of how things evolved Audio introduces the all-new A-Series line of monitors, featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, built-in DSP-based room correction, and speaker voicings, allowing you to customize your Atom Audio monitors to your control room. The A-Series will rock in any studio. Small studio spaces or immersive multi-speaker configurations are perfect for the A4V or the new A7V, the next generation of the 
incredibly popular A7X. Mid-sized rooms and narrow spaces will love the low-profile A44H, expanding on the A7V sound, or the A77H, a true three-way midfield monitor delivering rich, spacious sound. And bigger studios will love the A8H, a three-way speaker and the pinnacle of the A-series that delivers extremely accurate sound required for critical listening environments. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for your studio with an extended five-year warranty at AdamAudio.com. So, so question about that. One of the things that, that um, I feel like you see in music and in art is um, the way that artists break things to be, to create new things. So like um, even the, um, just so examples, even the Junior Brown record you did where he's quoting Hendrix, you know, on the guitar, Hendrix was known for breaking the electric guitar sound into something new, feedback and things like that and, and all that. And you have tools that come along like auto-tune, which get broken and then all of a sudden share, you know, it's like, oh, that's a new way to do a chorus sound. Yeah. What What are some things that you've seen in your experience of, um, you know, making, working with car- country artists too and stuff like that, where you see the artists breaking it? And, and I'm I'm kind of getting ahead to the point of like, how do you, how do you think people will break immersive sound to create whole new experiences? Well, you realize that the fuzz tone was created in Nashville, right? No, tell us, tell us that. That's great. Yeah, really that's for that. real. And, uh, um, it was a steel guitar player basically had a box and it was broken. Speedy West, somebody like that. Who, I, I can't tell the story properly cause I can't remember. So I tell the good part. Um, but that's, that's it. And so they basically, um, like wow there's listen to that sound that is so cool and then they actually built the fuzz box the original fill, awesome. fuzz box and marketed it so that came out of nashville and then it came out on um um satisfaction for the stones or yeah. something like that right yeah i mean it's you know so it's uh um but that was that was a, a happy accident that happened. Yeah, yeah um there's you know i mean the it happens all the time that something it, like I was mixing brothers in arms, right? Um, that album. Yeah. And on the song money for nothing, the star Straits, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was doing the, the 25th anniversary or 20th anniversary, whatever it was. And, um, that sound I had always known was, um, of the guitar. Mark's guitar was a wah wah pedal kind of just half cranked or you know he found that spot but i you know i'd known a million different guys try to like kind of in in the studio go i want to get that mark knopfler sound you know and so they would they would like kind of put the pedal at just sort of this like spot and yeah it's kind of there but wasn't really quite there and so you know i'm i'm doing the remix of this record and the, the only thing that i had i didn't have any like notation except for one track sheet from mix down where the where stuff had come up and and so i knew what effects that they had kind of incorporated neil dorsman had done the original record and it was you know it was mind blowing record i mean to me i heard that record and I, it just was like um it lived in the cd player just like looping and i would mix my country record or whatever record i was working on and i would a b okay i'm getting kind of close to cool <laughs> you know That's great. i just thought That's that great. he had done such a great job with that record um and um so at any rate that guitar sound was not just the wah-wah pedal set at a certain spot but they had uh, with the this goes back to the sony 3348 again they had done a clone you know, a digital bounce so that they could do a fix or something. And um, on the 3348, there was a slight time difference. I don't know what nice. it was. It might have even been under a millisecond, it, but there was a slight time difference when you do a bounce. And the sound was the two tracks being played together because it was also causing this phase right. cancellation. And, and it wasn't, I mean, I was, try, I was going, well, how come? 
the track that I know I'm supposed to use doesn't sound right. And and I noticed that there was a clone track of it, and I just happened to put it up, see if if that was the right one. And when I pulled the two up together, there it was, was like, sound. oh, there it is. That's great. That's great. <laughs> um, that song, Money for Nothing, going and listening to that again, I remembered the intro, but hearing it again, it, what a powerful crescendo on the intro of that song. It's like one of the greatest intros ever. Um, yeah, I, I talk think, about remixing that and, and reassembling that whole thing and trying well, to get it that thing. The, well, number one, um, I went over to England. Like This was the third time that I went to England to try and mix that album. Because the first two times I get over there and we start looking at the assets that they had assembled and they didn't have it all. So I go, I'll go, go looking again. And, and fortunately, you know, I was working with Mark. I think that's how we finally ended up finishing the, uh, the Mark Knopfler, Amy Lou Harris duet album was because, you know, they didn't have, we didn't have all the assets there. So we, like, well, I said, we're well, here. we'll work I said, on this. We got, all this <laughs> we got all this stuff just sitting on the shelf. We, the way that record that were, there was never a deal to do that record. We just, um, when Mark would come to town, we'd invite Emmy over for a day and we'd just have fun and record with Emmy, you know, and, um, you know, not, anything to get Emmy in the room, right? right? right, right, right. <laughs> She's so cool. Um, but at any rate, so we had all this material just sitting on the shelf and, um, but it wasn't finished and, and so I said, well, while I'm over here, why don't we mix that, you know? So we kind of did some more fixing and and ended up mixing it. But that that's getting off point. So so the third time I go over to mix the album, we finally have everything. And uh, um, even though it's stated on the CD that it's a DDD, in other words, digital, digital, digital. Right. Um, there was actually some analog slaves and stuff like that. So that wasn't entirely accurate. But we So we... <laughs> Transferred everything analog at 96K and upsampled the digital stuff. Unfortunately, I mean, because they did that on uh, the the 3324, the the 24 track version before the 48 track version came out. Yeah. And they did it at uh, Montserrat, Air Montserrat Studios. They had one of those machines shipped over and they had like so many reels of digital tape. And I mean, this was like the very beginning, right? So, yeah. you know, if something failed, it was gone. Yeah. And so this, it, that's the thing to remember, Rockstars, these, these digital machines, they were taped. So it still was analog tape running across a head and everything, but it was just digital and information. And there wasn't was a second machine to make a clone of it or a, a copy. So if the tape failed, it was gone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so that drum intro on that song is um, Mark. Knopfler's drummer, Terry Williams, was the one who played that intro drum thing. And that's the only thing they kept from the entire album of his drumming on it. The rest of it, they they brought Omar Hakim in, and he played the rest of that song and everything else on the album. Well, it's it's wild because when you listen to the intro that, it has this quality of the band sort of getting ready on stage and launching into a song, which was... It, to me, it, it so effectively depicts this kind of 80s big performance concept, you know? And then the song, when it launches, it feels like a big stage performance, too. Um, yeah, so I, when I did the remix, I did it in, in 5-1 as well. It's actually one, one of my Grammys was... Uh, well done, be, well It done. was the second best immersive uh, Grammy given out. Al Schmidt got the first one. I got the second one. Elliot Shiner got the third one. Blah 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 blah. Wow. But I'm sure it can be hard to keep track sometimes. <laughs> well, no, it's uh, I I can remember that because Elliot and I were just talking about that. He, you know, Elliot's got the um, he does the ELS um, sound system in all the Acura cars, and he goes when I tune tune the cars. He said the first thing I put on is that that record of that you did. He said that's the best surround record ever done wow and I, I, I mean i go elliot come on man because he's he he's in my opinion the best surround mixer ever but um so what was i going to say oh and so another interesting thing about that song you know it's it's they've got sting singing on it with mark right well sting just happened to be on the island and mark 
and him would like play tennis in the morning before Mark would go into the studio. And he's, he said, well, Hey Sting, why don't you just swing by the studio someday? And he did. And, 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 and so that was all like, that's him going, I want my MTV. Yeah. He just came up with that on his own. And, you know, and then sang on the record. It wasn't ever planned that it was going to be a duet with Sting. He just happened to be on the island and, and Mark asked him to come by and hang out and, and why don't you, hey, why don't you get in there and sing on this? What thing? about the lyric? What about just like, I want my MTV? Was that, was that sort of I think that was, you know, it was well? at the very beginning of MTV. And I think Sting just like, he probably came was up with staying that. in a hotel there was, and they didn't have it. Huh? He was probably staying in a hotel at Montserrat and they just didn't have it yet. <laughs> it could be. It could <laughs> be like, that, hey, baby. Man, I, I want, want my MTV, <laughs> dude. I, I, I'm not sure. I, you can't quote me on this, but I, I feel as though that Mark had to give up a certain percentage of the royalties to Sting for that. Wow. Well, you know. So it was it was a hook. Yeah. That's a that's hey, a he's funny done thing. All you know? Right. You know, Mark's yeah. done all right. Yeah. I think Sting's done all right too. Yeah. I think I think we're all doing all right. Come oh, to think gosh, it. I was just we're still here hanging out in the studio talking about making records. That's pretty all right I, to uh, I, and I was just talking to my wife who's back over in England trying to get her passport uh renewed and She's just going, you know, it's because it's been a few years since she's been back over, and she's just going. We're so lucky. I, and I said, "Yeah, we're we're so lucky. We got, you know, we got a pretty good life here, and um, not a lot to complain about." You know, yeah, she's, is- she's struggling having to, you know, get on trains and tubes and stuff like that, and dealing with, you know the whole immigration office and yeah, come on, coming back to Nashville we're getting on a tube means cracking open a beer and you're in the river right. <laughs> <laughs> um okay cool so let's see what else do we want to talk about there's so much cool stuff you've done and it's it's really fun just kind of going with this the flow of this um, one of the records I mentioned Junior Brown that one really just hit me listening to um your discography um and I loved hearing the the guitar and I, I, it sounded like pedal steel, but maybe it's lap steel. And well, he he's got this whole um, pedal guitar thing. That's um, yeah. What's that all about? That that's a junior junior craziness, man. I mean, juniors like you know we talked about uh, musicians being kind of slightly off center. Well, Junior's just a little more off center than most. <laughs> <laughs> we had so much fun. Um, just hanging out together. I mean, really did he? And he's just a very inventive guy. Um, his guitar style is just crazy, wacky out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like you said, he kind of like fashioned himself a bit after Jimi Hendrix. But he he invented this guitar thing that um is like pedal steel, but it's it's a guitar. So. So it's like a pedal steel, but it's on the guitar itself. Yeah. That's wild. You know, um, that w- I mentioned earlier, um, Steve Hennig, and I remember when I was interning there, he was talking about how he had been working on this six pedal guitar strat kind of thing that was like this very complex system. Way, but- way, way back when I first started, I was working at this studio called Sound Lab, and um, we would do a lot of um a lot of this stuff where you know somebody came into town they weren't really you know an artist they weren't they but they had money and they wanted to make a record so um buddy emmons the the fabulous steel player buddy emmons and phil ball who was at the time a you know a fabulous guitar player um they kind of had a business together and doing these these records and you know i mean literally in a day the you'd make an entire record. We'd track the record with backgrounds and everything live. That kind of stuff and, is fun. I love sessions. And the playback fast. to, you know, the playback. And the musicians wouldn't come into the control room. The artists could come in. And for the longest time, musicians never came into the control room. You had studio speakers. So that's how they heard the playback. But that playback, you'd roll the two track and that was your mix. So... Um, and the next song, you know, and by the end of the day, you had a whole album done. But Phil Ball had had a whole guitar thing that was pedals. So um, he every string was on a pedal, and he would just do he would do this thing. Buddy and him would like trade steel licks. It was incredible. 
Well, it's one of the things that I felt very fortunate to be able to record. I did a lot more of it early on than I do now, but coming to Nashville is one place in the world where you get an opportunity to record these incredible pedal steel players. Yeah. And to me, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it, it, I learned to appreciate it like a full orchestral instrument in the way that a piano is like a full orchestral instrument, you know, and in other words, it's capable of this great spectrum of frequencies and sounds and expressions and stuff. And, and it's just cool, you know, but what are some things that you've learned about recording and mixing a steel, um, you know, or I guess, I guess we'll call it any, any bendy string instrument like that. Well, again, speaking about being off center, I mean, to, to actually think about that instrument, you have to really have your brain in another planet, you know, I mean, it's, um, but before moving on, to what your question is, is the reason I got to start working with Mark and Dire Straits was uh, the fabulous Paul Franklin, I think the world's greatest steel player. He was had done a record with Mark, um, with Chet Atkins, the Neck to Neck album. And Mark was like so taken with Paul's musicianship that when he, you know, the On Every Street album, which is the album that I went over to do with Mark, Dire Straits had actually broke up after Brother in Arms. And Mark decided to put the band back together, kind of help out some of the guys who were kind of needing, you know, to get back out on the road. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, but he said, if I do it, Paul's going to be in the band. So they started out this record, um, and Bill Schnee was the engineer that they started with. Bill's and, great. He's been on the show. Oh, too. I love Bill. He's he's moved to town too, and so we get to hang out. And in fact, he was hanging out at our Blackbird event the other you know weekend. Uh, um, he's a really sweet guy. But anyhow, he had started the record, and um, Mark had really wanted somebody who could be there th- for the whole album. And Bill had other things that he needed to be doing. Couldn't commit, you know, family, all this sort of stuff. Um, the amount of time to be over there um, for the entire album. So they decided to part ways, and Bill's got a different rendering of this than what Mark has. But um, I, Mark just asked Paul, so who's good in Nashville? And that's when Paul said, we well, should get Chuck. That's and great, yes. So, Thanks to Steel. Right? Yeah, we owe yeah. a lot of gratitude I mean, to the I always Steel. Do, yeah, um, so... You know, your musicians, you know, treat them kindly because they're your best friends when things go wrong, but also they're the ones that more times than not get you the next gig. So. Yeah, I mean, I've, that's one of those funny lessons about doing this stuff for a career, too, is learning things like um, treat your interns kindly because they could be your next boss one day. You know, it's like, yeah. especially early on, you know, um, this you just never know. It's like... On, on a certain level, everybody who's here is doing it because they love it. So they're probably, you know, going somewhere with this thing, this music thing, you know. So you kind of never know who's going to be where down the road. That's right. And the ones that, like, take off the fastest sometimes fall the fastest. And the ones that are doing the long climb, you know, they're the ones who stay longer, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, so just a, a funny little story. We were doing... it. W- I think it was one of Mark's solo records that Paul Franklin was playing steel and he, he had this, you know, like most of the session musicians here, they have a rack of gear and then, you know, there's speaker cabinets, you know, that they bring to the studio. Yeah. He had a, a speaker cabinet that had a certain kind of speaker in, in the top and a certain kind of speaker in the bottom. And, you know, from song to song, he'd say, well, let's use the top speaker or let's use the bottom speaker. And we had recorded a song using the top speaker, and he'd switched to the bottom speakers. And it, it may have just been like that quick, and you know, it was like that first take kind of thing. And there, we, there was that was never relayed to me that you know the, right, it was the we had the switched speakers switched and, and, and the gain know, was yeah. low. So I think I just turned up the gain on it or something like that. And he came in as like. God, 
that steel sound. Everybody was like loving on the steel sound. Well, I wasn't actually even micing the, <laughs> the right speaker, but it was like for that song, it was just real ethereal and and had that space and um, to it that was awesome. And uh, I, years after that, we would try to kind of duplicate that effect, and it never worked. So That's... don't don't necessarily try and do that, but. Yeah, and I've, you, know, I've, I, I, you ask. I mean, your question was, "Have I thought of anything that that I would do differently for that type of an instrument?" And you know, it's, um, I don't really have a, something that that I do in particular. I just know that on Paul, a uh, uh, Sennheiser four twenty one is like the thing. Okay, and like on Dan Dugmore, uh, fifty seven is the thing sometimes i'll put a a royer in there and um that kind of you know but you just you learn the different musicians and their sound and and half the time it's like you know if i were to put something on that um amp for dan dugmore and other than a 57 he would look at me funny and go do you have a 57 yeah you know i mean a lot of this stuff you learn from the musicians and i i i am I don't have a, too much ego to like not learn from them. You know, generally I'll go, you know, I'm, if it's an instrument that you're unfamiliar with, you know, just go like, where would you, you know, or where has somebody else or whatever ask, you know, I mean, yeah. what mic do you use? You know, I mean, what's, what's like working for you, that kind of thing. And that's a, another great way of learning you know it's the the shared wealth of information that you get from being in a town like this like walking down the hall to the you know studio a if, and hanging out with who's ever in there and going oh well, so what are you doing there man you know and the stuff that you pick up just from other people is like great yeah if you are mixing music, podcasts, or audio for video, and you want it to sound amazing, then Isotope has got your back. With RX, Ozone, Neoverb, Nectar, and VocalSynth, you'll have a collection of powerful apps and plugins that will help you get a professional sound in no time. Whether you're looking to clean up your vocal recordings with RX, master your tracks with Ozone, or add depth and ambience to your mixes with Neoverb, Isotope is your magic wand for awesomeness. Plus, with Nectar and Vocal Synth, you can easily add creative effects and unique textures to your vocals and instruments. From subtle mix enhancements to extreme sound design, Isotope takes your music and podcast productions to the next level. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off. I remember learning that, um, or just like thinking maybe that was a good approach, you know, when I'd have a musician and somebody comes in with an upright bass. And like, Where do you find that you usually like yeah. to put the mic on this to get the best sound? Because a well, lot of these instruments are, are different, different too, you know? So every one of them's kind of got a sweet spot. Yeah, no harm in starting with some information, you know, don't, right. don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Right. Yeah. And then if you don't like it, you can always change it. But um, it reminds me of a story I remember hearing from Eric Valentine, um, totally different genre, you know, in the rock space. And um, who I'm also up and up on the show as soon as I can. But he was talking about recording Queens of the Stone Age and this great, like, just rock guitar, Josh Holmes uh, rock guitar sound. And that the this this sound that they loved and that they stumbled on and like had to have it that way was a um, a biodynamic M160, but it was between the speakers of a 412 cabinet. So it was uh, like you know kind of mic in the wood in the wrong spot. Right. So it's it probably that same thing where like the phasing happening from the two different speakers and how it hit the mic was the sound. It gave it that filtered kind of effect. Yeah, I was. Uh... We were doing one of the more later Knopfler albums, and Mark wanted to have Kim Wilson, the fabulous Thunderbirds harp player, uh, singer, whatever, you know, play on the record. And Kim came over, and, and Mark's studio, uh, British Grove, is one of the greatest studios on, on the planet in more ways than one. But it's it's built so that each booth has sliding doors. You can open the booth up and 
everybody can be in the same room or if you need the isolation you can yeah i like close. the, the sliding porch door trick is yeah great. it's really it's an, and just acoustically it's a great room technically quick question it, yes quick question so the sliding door thing can we think about building home studios where we just get like a you know a home depot sort of sliding door and we just put two of them in there and that gives a good little bit of a sound lock generally no because the glass is is not um you know, it's just plate glass. It's not tempered glass. And, right. And so it's got a point to it. Right. Um, there's a studio, a really nice studio here in town. Um, the initials are SS. Um, and they have a real problem with the the timpani or tympanic uh, Membranes of sound of that glass. That kind of glass. It's yeah, like, particularly like in the piano room, you just hear, it's like, every time the bass drum you hear this like it's so two panes i mean two doors would be better than one for sure but you're still going to have kind of that transference problem yeah it's, it's cool to hear you say that because we've talked about studio construction recently on the show and that again that issue of like tempered glass being the desired kind of glass it's just good for us to well, hear that again. Generally, too. multi-layer too, right? So you know, I mean, you have layers of glass that are sort of fused together, and that's just like plywood. It makes plywood less resonant than solid wood. Interesting. Um, it's the same same idea. Oh, right. That's why speakers are often built speakers out of plywood. Speakers are always built out of plywood. Oh, ah, man, yeah. we're learning all kinds of cool <laughs> shit on the show, and that's what I love too. Is when we get a chance to talk um, with somebody like yourself, who's got that, the, you know, the years and years of experience. And we're just reminded there's so much we can learn from um, shit that was figured out a long time ago, right. real yeah. basic stuff for audio. That's so critical now, uh, despite the fact that we live in a world of all these digital, you know, bells and whistles and magic, magic plugins and things, you know, there's a lot of really fundamental stuff that, that is helpful. Even what you just said about speakers and the stereo speakers, the 5K dip, I was not aware of that before you brought that up. And that that, that has led us to, to choose favorite microphones that fill that gap in. Now, what I wanted to follow with that was saying, will the world of immersive audio introduce us to new favorite microphones, do you think? Because they will respond differently the way they come out of the speakers. Uh, well, I, I would imagine that there's going to be some sort of array microphones that will be developed to kind of... Um, What's the one that's out now? The one that I forget what it's there's called. There's one that's like a sphere of yeah. microphones. There's a sound field microphone. See, right. Yeah. That's been around uh, for ages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they'll Ambisonic. Be that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. So there'll be microphones, I think, that will be kind of designed to kind of capture a a space um but you can do things with arrays of microphones too just kind of uh, one of my favorite like for the lyle record um I, you know a microphone company that a lot of people aren't too aware of and i think makes some of the best microphones uh, of anybody is is sankin yeah and um they they have this 100k microphone it's an omni microphone but it doesn't really sound like an omni because it's got this uh, response where it's actually rising all the way up to 100K. It's, it's, it's got, you know, it's peaking up like 15 dB at 100K or wow. something crazy. But it, it somehow creates this sort of more um, immediate sound. So for an Omni, you know, it's, it, I, used, I used four of them over the drum kit, kind of hung from the ceiling uh, on that Lyle Lovett record. And... It just created this, you know, I could have them in each of the height speakers. Oh, wow. And it just, it just made the drums feel so real. Like the, and, and that's something that, you know, you, you have this surround space that you have with immersive, but you also have the height space. And it's that width in imagery that really makes things feel more real than, than any other experience that I've had, you know? Um, so like utilizing height in that way to kind of create width of size or heights, you know, size of things. Um, yeah. So, so but, it's exciting that we'll be able to have, you know, headphones where we can experience what your intent was on that. But 
if we can't be there in the studio with you listening on the speakers, how are we going to clink our glass and when we're celebrating and how awesome it sounds? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, hopefully this, I mean, I think the stereo record actually sounds really good too. So yeah. um, it's just an expansion on sound and, and that's the way I think it ought to be. I mean, there, I ran into um, an engineer whose initials are CLA at AES recently and for it was actually before the show had opened and we had manufacturers badges so we were in there and we were talking about uh, atmos or immersive whatever and he was he was going yeah i mixed the stereo record and then i i leave and i let the assistant engineers make the stems and and do the atmos mix and he goes the thing is is that i just want exactly the stereo mix panned out so that if it folds down, it becomes the exact stereo mix. Mm -hmm. And I go, but, but that's not a very good way to utilize that space. Um, because you you have to make different, I mean, bottom end changes. Everything changes when you start spreading things out. Mm -hmm. Okay, it may fold down to uh, stereo, but the only, the only, I mean, actually, you, you're not going to hear the fold down really anywhere apple you're going to hear either the stereo mix or if you have a device capable of playing immersive it will do the immersive playback so this fold down thing just didn't make any sense to me and and i guess my point is is that it is a different mix it's right. not the same mix i mean in, you can you can either start out in the immersive space and make it so that the fold down works good, or you can do the stereo, and then you have to kind of reimagine the immersive space. Um, either one of those are kind of like um, you're, you're having to kind of sacrifice one for the other. Well, I mean, if so, if, I think they're really two separate mixes. Yeah, that's fair. So, so the idea that if the if the sur the streaming service, which is how often we are listening to music these yeah. days, if it recognizes that you're either listening to the stereo version or the immersive version, then it can just deliver a stereo version to your stereo speakers. Well, that's you, what Apple You does. get the yeah. intent that, yeah. you know, CLA wanted you to have. The, the only problem with it is, is that most Apple devices like your your new iPhone or your new iPad or your new laptop, they're going to default to the immersive. Right. So you're hearing the immersive mix rather than the stereo mix. And, in, and, but and, in headphones, because they think you're also listening in earbuds. No, right? on this, when you're listening on this. Right. And what, how, how do we describe that experience? I listen on the speakers of my iPhone all the time. Well, but I don't know what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hate it when, when you, you know, the art, artist is like making, some critique of your mix and and you're like kind of scratching your head going how's now how are they getting that and you go so what exactly are you listening to well my iphone <laughs> jeez yeah you know um and and that's there's nothing wrong with that but let's not evaluate a mix entirely on that right? no yeah so, yeah I, um, I always feel like but my point was about the immersive thing is that you know because apple thinks you're listening to a, a device capable of playing immersive well you know that it's playing the immersive mix and so you're hearing the catalog remix by some assistant engineer who did right. like three songs a day and that kind of bums me out right you know i mean the i don't so you know if you want to hear the original stereo mix you probably need to make sure that your device is switched to stereo play yeah yeah that's a good tip rock stars yeah. is make sure that if you want to hear the stereo mix that you're intentionally double checking that you're getting it and again i mean you know we're we're headed towards the good stuff here so <laughs> the experience of all the immersive stuff is going to uh the promise is there and, and the hope of um being able to effortlessly experience it like the intent is pretty well, exciting. like you said a while back um was you know now's the time to be practicing to get good at it because it is here i mean it's not going away i mean it's is definitely here to stay yeah okay. and so we need to learn how to make it great and uh you know that's it's it's a big study you know i mean nico bolas was saying uh you know he he before he 
finally got a mix that he thought sounded good enough that he could play it to Al Schmidt. He'd done like 13 different versions of it and tried all these different things before he was ready to play it for Al. And then Al listened to it and he said, what is that? (laughs) (laughs) But another Nico story, you know, Nico does all the Neil Young stuff or has done over the years. And, and, uh, so he he did an immersive mix for for Neil and uh, and Neil came back to him and he said, "Hey Neeks, is there any way you can make that sound like my mono?" That's great. <laughs> he just well, you know, I mean, so. was he just messing with him? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that for Neil is it's like you know I don't want to hear things coming from all around the room. He's wanting to hear it focused and you know, and be that amazing thing that mono can be. Yeah. Mono is cool. I mean, I, I've been learning to reference my mixes on the mono speaker on the little Avantone on the desk. And, um, and even just the experience of actually mixing it that way for a minute and making decisions, it's like, it's a, it's a cool sound. I mean, mono is. Well, for years, I always used to like, a B the mono to the stereo because it, it makes you get uh bolder yeah. in your stereo mix. You yeah. know, the stuff that's out on the fringes left and right when it when you it, turn it gets up. brought into mono, it kind of goes away, you know, and things like pianos can kind of disappear because the phase relationship between the microphones and stuff. So you would always and when I started, I mean we were still broadcasting mono. And I mean, we were still mixing a separate mono mix and stereo mix. Um, so, you know, because it was two different things, just yeah, kind of like what yeah. we're talking about immersive and stereo. Are well, two because, different and, things. and for a long time, your mix would come out of clock radios or a TV speaker right. as mono. So yeah. it was very significant. Yeah. So you mentioned, is it Avana tone? What is that? Oh, Avon tone is a powered speaker that is a it's a like a modern self-powered version of the oratone okay so yeah well i was just gonna say oratone i thought that's kind of what you were referring to so the yeah oratone when that came along it was like that was so cool because it actually sounded pretty good compared to the crappy little speakers that were built into the console you know oh right right and then you sometimes remember? you'd use the um sometimes the tape machine you're printing yeah, to would have a mono speaker that tape, on it. the speaker in the in, in the, and I used to do that for years too. It's just like like reference that mono speaker out of you know in the back of the room where this tape machine was. You know, and not not in any particular position. You know, right, but you you just get an overall vibe off the mix. You know, yeah. what's missing in this mix? And it's kind of a little bit like listening to your iPhone. You know, like <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was, was going to bring it back. To I that. know to bring it all back around. <laughs> I mean, I do that too. Is I'll uh, I'll. After I finish a mix, you know, I listen to it on the iPhone before I send it to the artist just to see, because there's a whole nother reference point. It's a, I mean, so many people listen like that, yeah. you know, I mean, so yeah. it's got to actually work, I listen right? like that because a lot of times, you know, I'm walking around the house, I'm on the yeah. go. It's like, I'm, you're checking your phone and there's the thing and you want to listen to it or you, I mean, like, yeah. you want to hear it right then. You don't want to have to go to, you know, yeah. wait till tomorrow and you're in the studio or whatever. <laughs> Do you ever feel like the time that you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take you years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David, quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process that I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along 
the way, but condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that this will take your mixes to the next level that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick. And I'll see you at the front row table of the Grammys. Cheers. We are heading towards the end of the episode, but can I ask you a couple more questions as we close out? Okay, awesome. So um, Mary Chapin Carpenter is another artist that you've worked with. And um, there was a, um, I think it was the song or the album Iceland that had just this beautiful finger-picked acoustic guitar. And one of the things that I heard pervasively across your records is this real skill in taking a vocal and making it sound really bigger than life and full and warm up front and center. And and her sounds that way there too. So h- how can we record something like a finger picked ac- acoustic and a vocal and have it all just sound like e- both of those instruments got everything they deserved in the, in the final mix? Well, she's got an amazing voice and she's a really skilled guitar player as is Mark Knopfler in, in they have that sonic thing, you know, mm-hmm. and they both play and sing at the same time, which is a real challenge. Uh, you know, it's hard to get the, get the acoustic guitar and the vocal to sound like really good and have the separation. In, and then how do you fix things and all right, that sort right, of stuff? Right. So, um, both of them, I mean, I kind of developed an idea of like, um and, and Lyle, the same thing. I mean, the, the, these are, you know, I mean, pretty much the the voices that you talk about, they they sound great because they're great voices. Yeah. Van Morrison, was, you know, I mean, they're just these voices. Uh, Leanne Womack, I mean, just kills me. Uh, Reba McIntyre, George Strait. I mean, they're all great voices, and you don't want to hide them. Number one, so you know, I mean the. It's it's the weaker voices, the ones that kind of aren't, you know, don't have that something that you end up tending to kind of like shove into the mix a little bit more and wrap them around with more instrumentation just to kind of make it more glorious, you know? Mm-hmm. Those great voices, you, yeah, it's like you could turn the music off and you'd have a record, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like... Um, I, at any rate, that well, I kind I mean, of rambled you know, there. Speaking a of bit, which, but, those Waylon Jennings records and recordings you did too, same thing. It's same like, thing. I mean, it's, so um, I and I've just been so lucky to work with really great um, artistry um, over my career. So you know, and then, and then there was the ones that weren't so great, and Nafra would go, "How how can you do those records?" And I, you know, I go, "Well, Mark, it's like, you know, I try and." give my all to every record that I do, no matter what, and try and make it as good as it's, it can be because that artist may only get one or two shots at making a record. I'm going to make another 30, 40, 50 more, you know? I mean, it's so I always try and give everything to them, but it's that's where I learn. And that's and I, I tell him, I go, it's because of those records that I've learned my skills so that I can make your record. <laughs> he he asked great. me That's again great. though you know he never really quite understood that kind of mercenary thought of making a, a record um but he didn't have to um so back to your question about the the singer guitar player uh, it may not have even been your question but for for those kinds of artists it's one of the hardest things i find to do is like actually capture the acoustic guitar and capture the vocal um, and so kind of one of the, and both of those, like Mary Chapin and Knopfler and Lyle, they don't really like to record to click. So it's a challenge to figure out, okay, so how am I going to do this in a way that I can get another vocal that's clean or a guitar that's clean? And so kind of what I would do is record an open vocal mic and re-record the acoustic guitar pass so so if i needed to fix a vocal line or word or something i'd have the sound of the open vocal mic and the guitar that i could insert and then grab the 
the vocal with an open guitar mic. Ah, very and, clever. And then that way, it's a pain, but that's really the only way to keep the continuity of the sound. Um, it's not as much as a pain as some of the things I've decided to invent for getting through a session. <laughs> Believe me, you get you get really comfortable with things that are a pain in the ass when you're trying to make engineer great records, right? Well, that's it, yeah. I mean, part of what we do, and sometimes you get tired of it being such tedium. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing the Frampton live shows for the umpteenth time. And that's like, how many times am I going to do this same process? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you kind of, it's like, it gets, it gets tiring, but that's why I'm enjoying this podcast. Cause I'm not having to do the you tedium do right it, no, now. You just get to talk about it all. <laughs> I have to go back to that. Um, I need to get that finished before the end of the month. Um, so but one of the one of the tricks that I've done with that uh, Chapin and Knopfler and Lyle was um, DPA came out with a, a microphone on a boom. It's uh, the forty ninety nine or I think that's what it is forty ninety nine. So it's it's a really high quality microphone on a boom and it clips to the guitar. And so I mean I get that as well as an out front microphone, but it, it's like it can kind of fill out the out front microphone um, in a way that you can't get enough from just the out front mic and a vocal mic. Um, yeah, that's great. And I'm so, going to, and it um, stays in position, you know I mean? As they move around when they're singing, it's always there. You yeah. Know? Well, it was not like a James Taylor thing where, where they would clip the mic into the guitar. Right. It's the same soft. Like even from the inside towards the fingers or something. So you get all that super detail. Right. I ended up buying a lavalier just so I could experiment with yeah, that. Yeah. We used know? to do that back when, you know, we'd record everybody all, now we have booths, you know, but yeah. you'd put everybody in the same studio and i mean trying to get an acoustic guitar without just a ton of bleed on it you know it's hard so we throw, drums, we'd throw you know? a sony ecm50 inside um actually a sure 57 doesn't sound bad you just gotta wrap it in some foam so it doesn't like bang around inside the guitar but really you just yeah. and it just like sits in there in within the body of the guitar yeah Oh man, yeah. so I'm dropping a marker on that one <laughs> take that to the bank rock stars so you take a a 57, a 57 like, wrap it in some phone so it doesn't clunk around. Oh, he needs around. a 57, man. He's like... But isn't it... But then you also have to have the mic cable sort of going in through the sound hole yeah. and not bothering the guitar player. Yeah, you, you know, that... But, you know, if you, if you can take tape and use the kind of, like, tape that doesn't, like... You know, you don't want to use duct tape, but we have... We call it... Scotch makes this tape called Ride-On that you always see on the channel strips that we, we kind of right what yeah, instrumentation yeah. is on the console but that or sort of like painter's tape you know that won't kind of peel yeah the blue stuff yeah but don't put it on the guitar you can kind of use that on the the pick guard right and and that's not going to cause a problem you can put it on your own guitar but don't put it on the yeah, client's guitar <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that so much like with the 4099 what it's a really thin wire so um, what I do is I kind of take it along the back and then I make a loop and put it over the, um, uh, guitar strap on the back of the guitar, you know, the little guitar strap hook Yeah, and yeah. just kind of loop it around that. And then that keeps the, the cable kind of on the back side of the guitar and, but not like wiggling around and everything. Okay. So, so Rockstars, I'm going to, I'm going to reiterate something that Chuck said, just to make sure it's clear. The trick he was talking about is that when you're doing a vocal and an acoustic, you have multiple mics that are getting both things and your voice is on the acoustic guitar, it's on the on the vocal mic too. So it's that combination of mics that is ultimately the sound for each instrument. So if you want to be able to do the fixes on the acoustic and on the voice later, grab a replacement of the like take of the guitar so that you could, I guess in that moment, you could cut to that guitar and and fill the gap and then you could do punch that vocal line a few times where it's on also on both mics and cut that in and uh, you probably i'm guessing that like your discerning ear can begin to pick up on whether it was the original or whether it was these doubled replacements but but it probably is pretty easy to to slip that in there and cover it up and, and stuff like that too 
Yeah, it, nothing about comping vocals is all that easy. I mean, it's <laughs> it's hard to make those decisions, especially at first. You know, it's like, what? Why is that take better than another take? You yeah, know? and and it's not it's not just about pitch. It's it's about you know emotion. Yeah. Um. Because and that's the beauty of tuning. I mean, I don't like to like just like put auto tune on something and blanket like make it in make it correct or whether it's whether you're doing it by hand or whatever i i i feel like that it has to be really discretionary because um going a bit sharp kind of like shows the intent of trying to get there and so but but the beauty of a tuner is the fact that you can maybe use a vocal that isn't like perfect pitch wise but has the emotion and um, so that's generally when I'm comping vocals. It's like I'm going for emotion and feel. Yeah. Um, and, what about when they come out with auto emotion? <laughs> you gonna feel? You gonna change your tune? Uh, you no know, Massenberg was talking about the the fact that you know probably um, not too far distant future, our job may be training AI that you know what is good. And yeah, and AI will probably replace all of us at some point. So. You hear that isotope? <laughs> get 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 cracking! Um, all right, so that's very cool. Uh, there was one other thing you said. You talked about working with an artist and giving it your all because they may only get to make one or two records. I, that's like so hugely important to me. That's just like, I mean, I, I really enjoy working with people that aren't going to be famous uh, because um, it's fun to help people just feel great about their music too. And, and just have this great experience. It's so um, appreciative too, you know, yeah. you, like that, that you've done that for them and giving them an opportunity, a chance at trying to have a career, you know, and, and career can be a really varied thing. I mean, I, you know, we get so stuck on this star sort of thing, you know, I mean, like, is that's not really the only career in the music business is being like um somebody really super famous i mean you can have a really great career and make good money and actually have a bit of a home life you know by yeah um doing a bit of touring but not like the full-on kind of thing and yeah and like you said if you're still in the game the long haul the long slow climb can be really valuable yeah experience i uh, I, I don't my career didn't like just take off like gangbusters i had to kind of work my way up and recently i was mentoring somebody um and uh we kind of do this through the recording academy is each each year i'll take on one or two mentors and and uh you know just but just telling her that you know you know be patient it will come you know really focus on quality and you know just trying to learn as much as you possibly can but that that it it not happening right this minute is probably a good thing because number one you'll value your climb and you it's going to make you want to stay in it longer and like I, I think I said earlier, is I, I knew so many people that like had instant success or relatively quick success, and I was going, "Why is this not happening for me? Why, you know?" And and my long road there, you know, I look back and where are they? You know, they're well, they're all way long gone. You know, so. yeah, they they don't, um, there's a term one hit wonder, but there's not a term for. You know, those of us who just stay in it for a long time, you right. finally finally achieve your success over yeah. over that long haul too, I guess. Um, all right, so, but I, one of my takeaways, you said, give it all you got. So I just wanted to ask you this question. How do we know when giving it all we've got isn't actually just screwing up the record? Well, that, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, you can over-engineer stuff. I mean, that's totally, like, when I first started, I always felt like I had to have the patch bay just full of patch cords you know like i had to have every cool bit of gear in the room plugged in if they now, had social now, media you would have been posting pictures of your patch bay every day <laughs> yeah well and nowadays it'd, it'd be like some of the sessions that you get you know where there's like 15 plugins on every track you know i mean it's like you know it it really is about the music it's about the musicianship and getting it right on the front end and if you can capture great sounds and 
and the emotion and the intent of the the song and the and and the artist then that's really kind of easy to mix and it comes through in in the in the final um so the idea that you have to make it all happen as the engineer by putting all these plugins and dialing all this EQ and slamming it and compressing it and and all that you know is is kind of the less is more thing generally yeah. it's like how many layers of guitars do you have to have on there you know i mean if you strip all that stuff away and you come get down to the essential of this the song it's going to be much larger um and 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 it's it's about knowing where to put things and um the arrangement you know is what creates the depth and and, and everything so uh, that to me that's the uh, probably the big takeaway from it that 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 you you can do far too much yeah yeah and try far too hard but what i meant by trying hard is not not like kind of sloughing it off you know like just right. oh well, this isn't going to do anything and not working very hard i i always tried to give my all always tried to be present always tried to like like offer up if it's my place to offer up uh, offer up um stuff that might help the record um be better i think that's good good advice yeah. um all right so closing question you ready for it Uh oh <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna take the way back studio machine you get to go back in time we feel, <laughs> i feel <laughs> like i've been like traveling down that tape for all rewinding <laughs> right and uh and you go back and you find young chuck who's who's like um Drums are fun, but maybe I should play guitar, you know, or, or wherever you want to be. Maybe you're you're at the first uh, recording session studio at Indiana University, Bloomington, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you say, listen, man, I've come back to give you this bit of advice. First of all, don't cut your hair for a while. <laughs> Second of all, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What, what advice would you like to go back and give yourself if you could? Uh, well... Gosh, that's so hard, you know. I mean, I I wouldn't really do a lot different because, you know, I mean, I've just like I mean, I've been married. This is my third marriage, so I wouldn't wouldn't like undo going through those marriages because I felt like I learned something in those first two marriages that allowed me to stay married to my current wife for the last twenty eight years. So, um, you. I think it's life is experience and, you know, sometimes learning the hard way, you learn things better than, than, um, the easy way. So, I mean, I don't know that, that you can really do that. Um, go back and change things, you know, yeah. that it's, it's just, it, it is, life is, is one big experience and try and make it a happy ride, you know? I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm happy I'm still here. I'm having a great time still. I still love music. I still love um, making music. It's it's one of the, the greatest things. Um, a, a friend of mine said something the other day that I thought was really, really cool. And it's like when they're talking to a mentor, um, it, it, it's like, okay, so what is your B plan if this doesn't work out? And, and he said, if they say my, they have a B plan, he said, go straight to your B plan now. Forget this. Because if, if you've got a B plan, you won't succeed. You've got to be 100%, 100 and plus percent devoted to this thing. And, um, you know, I got divorced a couple of times. I, you know, I, I was 100% in and that's kind of what you got to be. And there, there isn't a B plan, you know, I mean, um, you've, you've got to figure out how to make this work and there's no one path that's going to make it work for everybody either. You know, it's like, um, the way I did it is not going to be the way you did it and not the way any of your, your people on this um, you can refer to them. You can call them the rock stars. That's the, the, the way so any of your rock stars are going to do this. Um, I 
they're they're going to be their own rock star and that's what makes our business so interesting and wonderful and i mean they're going to create something new because their experiences are different than ours yeah and you know you can help share and encourage and that's kind of what i like doing at this point in my career is that i can i can help a young person just by encouragement and offering um some you know advice i, I just a couple of days ago this the mentee that i was telling you about um has since like gotten a good gig has since gotten a pay raise from at her job has since become a mixer for her job and and it's like actually really doing something really good and it's happening actually pretty fast for her and that she was one of those that i told us to just be patient but it is actually working for but the, I, what her big takeaway from our time together was that you know it's it's important that it's really good and that you know that not to make the sacrifices that some people are asking you to make like for the qual for sake of quality just you know for to make things less expensive to move quicker and all that she kind of said no i'm not going to mix three songs a day i'm only going to mix one a day they didn't like it at first but that her her work was so good that they let her do it yeah because cool. she she wrote me this letter is like a, a you know card but it was written from one side through the other side it was so sweet and how appreciative she was of you know the advice i'd given her so i mean that that really impacted me you know it's, yeah. it's nice to get that give back you know because i'm probably never going to see any of you the rock stars on the other end of this microphone so we're lucky sometimes i get to i get to um meet everybody here and there um, oh cool it's fun to go to to a big events you know like yeah. nam and stuff like that and then have somebody come up and just say hi yeah so yeah, rock stars. If you hear that, if you're at any kind of event, you spot me or spot Chuck, come say hi because we we, we want to know who's out there for yeah, sure. We see you today, yes. You know, and another thing that you bring up, Chuck, which which I love about doing this and sharing back through the podcast is, it occurred to me at one point, it's like, well, I could spend all my effort trying to make one record that I hoped a thousand people would want to listen to, or I could help a thousand people make records that you know thousands of people listen to or whatever. And it's like, oh, that's you know, teaching and sharing back is kind of a way to to ex expand your own ability to just make more music. <laughs> yeah, and and just another thing too, when you start and get burnt out on on making those you know those thousands of records, it I, I, I kind of at one point was at at that place and was telling Mark Knopfler that you know I mean I, I just don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. I'm just fried, you know, and, and he goes well, you don't get all those letters that I get in fan mail. And he said, you know, take this song or take that song. That song helps somebody through, you know, the death of their spouse or their mm. parent. And that song somebody got married to and blah, 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 blah. He said, the records that you have made have really changed people's life in a, in a really big way. And he said, you got to keep, keep going at it. And, you know, I mean, that's the greatest thing about music is it's it really alters our brain. I mean, it it you know, it's one of those few things that can kind of create a stamp in the brain to where like you might have heard it twenty years ago, but when you hear that song, that twenty years later, you're immediately transported back to that moment when you first heard it. It's, there's not many things that do that. Yeah. That's great, man. Well, in the interest of uh, hearing from your your fans, um, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show and and putting in this this almost epic podcast interview <laughs> no, got, at this point. I'm trying not to go back to work. <laughs> That's great. It's perfect, man. Um, so much awesome stuff hearing you tell the stories and and the the, the advice you've shared. But for the rock stars who might want to reach back out and say hi or whatever, where um where can they find you online? How how can they learn more about you? Or what if they're just ready to make their next most important record ever? Well, um, I hate to just give out my email address. The, the, you don't have to do that, but you, you got a website. Of, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the website is so seriously out of date. I hadn't done anything about it 
in like probably 25 years. Um, but I actually am about to change that. And that's, um, it's Chuck Ainley, which is spelled A I N L A Y at gmail.com. Right at the moment that, well, maybe by the time you hear this podcast, it'll be updated. Dude, it's cool looking. It looks like there's a little bit of a tie dye background. Oh, it's definitely uh, it's old school. Old school. You know, here's how you know I mean, when it's a throwback website, now it probably looks cool. Yeah, right? it's retro, man. It's retro. When you click, like, I think I clicked on one link and it was like, "Do you have Flash installed?" And right. I was like, "Oh, that's so awesome." <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, it's so old and hasn't been updated. Um, I, you know, Facebook uh, Messenger, you can find me. Cool, you know, cool. I mean, I, Twitter, all that stuff. Well, dude, thanks for coming over. Thanks for coming to the studio and thanks for talking to us for, you know, two and a half hours or whatever been going. Awesome. Yeah. And if, if we could just quick, um, you know, check in at metalliance.com. We, we have a, um, a book that's recently come out. It's called, um, recording and mixing drums. And it's it, before Al Schmidt and Ed Cherney passed away, they were contributors to it. So, the, the greatest engineer in the world, Al Schmidt, at least in most people's opinion, tells about how he did drum sounds. Ed Cherney, That's great. one of my favorite all-time engineers and greatest people in the world. Um, he tells Frank Filippetti, George Massenberg, Nico Bolas, myself, and Elliot Shiner uh, did the first book. And now we have Jimmy Douglas and Sylvia Massey in our group, and we'll be doing some more st cool stuff. That's super but cool. That's yeah, it's m e t a l l i a n c e dot com. And and if you don't like list uh, recording drums, you're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> uh, well, you know, so, uh, Jimmy's uh, Jimmy's like because you know he does more hip hop and sort of um, uh, machine uh, originated. That counts. Stuff. That counts. But with, I mean. So he's going, maybe maybe we need to modernize this book. But, you know, the th reason we kind of chose to do drum recording, and it's not just recording, it's drum recording and mixing. And it's really the philosophy, all this stuff that we've talked about, the philosophy of in the studio, mm -hmm. like etiquette and all that stuff is in there. Um, but one of the things that's done most poorly is is drum recording because people just it's, it's it's the hardest thing to do it requires tons of experience knowing what works and what doesn't work and this this um this book would give you definitely a big um step up on on how to get there um, okay but it's, it's, it's a pretty awesome um pretty awesome thing and uh we're about to put it um on sale too. We've been talking about that. Uh, right, on. <laughs> right on. Like that drum kit we probably bought for our studio, you know? Um, so I'm going to give it one other shout out to something that you should check out Rockstars, And I'll try and we'll try and remember to put a link in the show notes, but um, short of that, just Googling it, we'll find it too. Another place where I noticed your name was in the AES technical document that I was reading recently for the recommendation for delivery of recorded music projects. And that is a great resource um, for all of us to just go learn more about how to organize files, how to keep track of this stuff, how to name things properly and all that. That so, started out of the, um, at, in the Recording Academy, um, we actually were able to get label people to sit around the table with producers and engineers and, and technical people. And we started that paper, like, I think it was like, 2000 or maybe 2002 and it's been wow. revised and revised and revised you know obviously we we did the work and handed it to aes to get input from aes so it's a shared document but we it is a living document so we keep revising it um and in fact by the time of this this podcast there's going to be um, a brand new version that's um really uh it's a better interface too to be able to read it to so where you can search information oh, a, cool, lot, cool. a lot better. Um, but by the time this podcast come out, there'll be also uh, an immersive uh, recommendations paper. Oh, great. So, um, and, and you can go to Grammy.com or, or no, I'm sorry, it'd be like uh, producers and engineers 
dot com, and I believe that's um, spelled, that's what P and E stands for. P and E wings. Yeah, P and E is and producers and engineers. So it's producers, and it's spelt out and engineers dot com. And there's uh, the uh, the recommendations um, documents are in a subsection there, and there's tons of great stuff in there. And Rockstars, one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is. If you hear that and you think, oh, that's what does that have to do with me and my home studio? This is for record label kind of industry stuff. I think the answer is there's a lot that you can learn about how to actually manage your own sessions better and keep things organized and keep files together. Well, and the archives, I mean, you you yeah. know, I mean, just like with the immersive now, we need we need the original multi tracks so that we can go back and remix it. If you hadn't like archived your recordings properly, you know, a hard drive only sits on a shelf three years before it may not boot up again. And if you're not spinning up those drives and have secondary backups, maybe third backups that are in a different location. So in case of a fire or whatever, you know, temperature, humidity problems, you know, you may not be able to spin up that drive and be able to play your recording so you can take advantage of the new technology that's out there. So, um, but there are tons of a wealth of information and and um is really really important to everybody and also that we all get on sort of the same page like if if we're all naming things the same like there's a whole naming hierarchy about how you you know where your assets lie on that drive so that when you hand that drive over to somebody else to do a mix for you that they can actually find what they're looking for you know? yeah so all that stuff's in there it's incredible it's a lot of dedication by a lot of really smart people um, to do this, do that for free. And it's just there for you. All you got to do is go online, search it and learn it. Right on, man. Well, Rockstars, on that note, we're going to let you go off and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Chuck, thank you so much for hanging with us here in the studio. And um, thanks for listening, Rockstars. I look forward to seeing you around next time, it's Chuck. It's been a pleasure. All right, thanks. man. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rock stars now go make great music recording studio rock stars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who helped make this episode possible owc lewitt adam audio isotope and Spectra 1964. And remember, at isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko and Braden Streming for additional podcasts and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.